Excellencies, distinguished guests and participants. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And welcome to the second day of the Asia Pacific consultation on the priority theme of the 67th session of the Commission on the Status of Women. Innovation and technolo technological change and education for the digital age for achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. Before we begin, may I remind you that we will have two substantive sessions this morning and a review of the discussion of the recommendations in the afternoon. We will also have a morning coffee break and lunch break. Online participants, may I please request you rename yourself to your name, organization, and country. We also wish to remind you that the closed captioning is available, and this can be activated by looking at the Zoom settings at the bottom of your screen. For any technical issues, please send a message through the chat box to our technical team, and they will do their best to assist you. Otherwise, we kindly request online participants to remain muted and for their cameras to remain off unless they are invited to speak during the plenary. And for our in-person participants and speakers, we kindly request that you speak as directly into the mic as you can to ensure our online participants can hear you. We will now begin our third session on implementing economic, labor, and social policies that ensure women and girls are not left behind in the digital age and leveraging financing for inclusive digital development and gender transformative innovation. I now have the pleasure of introducing our moderator for our third session, Ms. Shina Lindstrom Ogzon, Social Affairs Officer, SCAP. Ms. Ogzon, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Jessica. Distinguished representatives, civil society partners, United Nations colleagues, good morning. I hope you all rested well and you have managed to both enjoy all the good food that Bangkok has to offer, digesting that and the food for thought uh, from yesterday's rich discussions and bold statements. Yesterday, we learned that however way we look at it, the digital gender gap is wide and it is widening. 2.7 billion people offline. 36% of whom are in the Asia Pacific region. And we learned that these emerging online inequalities mirror those on the ground, so to speak, where deep rooted gender inequalities continue to persist. And in our session yesterday on women and girls in STEM, we found that the issues already have been diagnosed and that we have the know how to bring solutions to the table. We just need to get together act as one and get the job done. And these discussions couldn't have been more timely in the wake of Safer Internet Day and just a few days before us celebrating the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And now we will commence the panel discussion of session three. In this session, we will focus on how tailored robust and gender inclusive economic labor and social policies contribute to bridging the digital gender gap. While we have heard already of some existing projects, programs and initiatives benefiting women and girls on the ground, it's important to make sure that overarching policy measures, the broad strokes of the brush, are in place to guide and inform these actions with a specific gender inclusive lens. For example, more gender inclusive labor policies, such as extended parental leave, equal pay, of course, and world, uh, workplace childcare facilities, encourages more women to embark on and advance their careers in ICT and STEM related activities. Or let's think of the rapidly developing digital financial services, while they bring abundant benefits and new opportunities to some women, there is also a risk that without efforts to ensure the inclusion of all women, they will further the gender gap in access to finance. And however way we look at it, it's also critical to challenge those stubborn gender stereotypes and patriarchal social norms, such as math is only for boys. We cannot make good on our commitment of leaving no one behind and, as we heard yesterday, leaving no one offline without increasingly robust 
comprehensive and gender inclusive policies. And that is exactly why I am so privileged today to introduce our expert panel to you. Just like yesterday, we will begin with an introductory presentation to set the scene, followed by a panel discussion, and then end with plenary discussions with participants here in the room and online. It is now my pleasure to introduce His Excellency Lamo Sitele, Minister of Women, Community and Social Development of Samoa, to deliver the overview. Deliver the overview. Testing for echo. Okay. His Excellency has worked with small and medium business development, agriculture and health services, including with the ADB and the World Bank. And now His Excellency in his current capacity specializes in the area of statistics, finance and banking, management and community development. Your Excellency, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Chairperson, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored to address this forum today as part of the Asia Pacific Regional Consultation on the priority theme of the 67th session of the Commission on the Status of Women. The theme is quite significant since it has far reaching implications on the improvement of lives of women and girls in families and in our communities. The panel discussion for this forum will therefore stimulate productive options, which could generate cost-effective innovations that can be adopted by women and girls to support themselves and their families in the long-term future. There have been many attempts and efforts spent on developing various platforms to support such innovations. And the agenda for this panel discussion is no different. The expected outcome of this discussion should help enhance our efforts to develop appropriate strategies in place to implement these innovations, such as the application of a user-friendly technology that relates to the theme of this year's forum. Samoa has been an active player for many years in efforts to achieve recognition of the status of women and girls they deserve. Samoa has therefore adopted an appropriate policy framework through ratification of various conventions to strengthen such efforts. Some of the initiatives implemented in accordance to this framework are reflected on the progress of Samoa key achievements so far. There has been a noted increase in the number of women representation in parliament, including the appointment of Samoa's first women prime minister. The other key cabinet women appointees include the Minister of Finance and Minister of Justice. There are also four women judges, which is a significant milestone achievement, especially for the judiciary. Participation in government services by women at the CEO and executive management levels have also increased significantly over the past five years. In addition, there has been a steady increase in the number of women bestowed with chiefly Matai titles, an indication of a change in leadership roles, not only within families, but in communities. There is a re reflection of the positive impact of women empowerment programs, which is a significant encouragement for our people as we sail into the future. The government of Samoa, under a new administration, embarked on a new strategic direction to focus more on human development. And as such, the pathway for the development of Samoa, PDS, a five-year planning initiative is in place, commencing July 2022 and June to June 2026. The PDS is well aligned to the priorities for social development, including focus on empowerment of women and girls. Timely implementation of the PDS is critical. And despite the challenges, the progress of initiatives implemented 
since the launching of the PDS is quite encouraging and summarized as follows. One, ongoing community programs for ending violence on women and children in collaboration with NGOs, gender equality programs, capacity building programs for inclusive governance, community oriented programs for the promotion of the rights of women and vulnerable persons, establishment of EU hub platform to promote adequate employment opportunities for youth in the communities, financial support for fees for adult and tertiary education, including women and girls, short-term overseas work program for youth with preference for women in age group 21 to 40 and a time frame between six to 36 months, financial support through grants and soft loans for micro and small enterprises with emphasis on women entrepreneurs as part of a stimulus incentive, community leadership program for women and girls, provision of financial benefits under the disability benefit scheme with particular attention on women and children, provision of financial support under the old age pension scheme, facilitation of the district development plan with focus on social and economic initiatives managed by each of the 51 district councils comprised of 14 members with 50% women representation and chaired by a member of parliament. In summary, despite these challenges, Samoa had faced has made encouraging progress with improvements needed in certain areas. The government is fully committed to enhancing its efforts for the empowerment of women and girls, especially over the last uh, uh, 12 months. And this is evident by the progress of social protection programs underway. Whilst the theme for this year relating to innovation and technological change is quite promising, the emerging challenges will need more attention. These are having the appropriate supporting technical infrastructure in place, addressing changing technology and affordability issues, gender equality issues, managing climate change risks, and determining the impact of economies of scale of uh, technology on small countries like Samoa. Nevertheless, the panel discussion may need to explore appropriate viable options, such as contingency technology for small island countries as practical sustainable alternatives to inspire women and girls involved in social entrepreneurship to support social well-being. In conclusion, I wish all the panelists a fruitful discussion, and I look forward to the outcome and knowledge and experience sharing as part of the consultation on the priority theme. God bless, so forth. Thank you very much. Your Thank you very much. Your testing for echo. And while we're here, just testing that uh, my sound now is better for online participants. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for framing our discussion this morning and sharing the comprehensive as results already achieved under the Samoa Development Pathway initiatives in particular, the impression, impressive results of women in leadership positions. Congratulations. But also, thank you for sharing with us some of the challenges that we are now facing, including on the impact of the economies of scale and how we may appropriately adapt these to smaller island states. Participants, we will now begin our panel discussion I will introduce each of the four panelists before asking them two rounds of questions. Panelists will have five minutes to answer the first round and three minutes to respond to the second. I will be very strict on time and I would like to apologize in advance for interrupting any panelists or participants during their interventions. This is just to allow everyone an opportunity to speak 
and have their voices heard in this important forum. Our first panelist is Mr. Nassim Sata, General Manager and Board Secretary of the Small and Medium Enterprise Foundation, SMEF, in Bangladesh. Mr. Sata served as Deputy Director of the Central Bank of Bangladesh and has also worked in the Ministry of Industry. Mr. Sata, my first question to you, good morning, to learn about is to hear more from you about how SMEF is currently developing a one-stop portal for women entrepreneurs. Could you please share with us how your one-stop approach will support the ambitions of women interpreters, entrepreneurs? Please, Mr. Sato, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? I think, I believe you hear. Yes, yes we, thank may, you. we can hear you. Good morning to everybody. and. Greetings from SME Foundation and the Ministry of Industries from to all the participants physically present and connected. And thanks Escape for uh, giving the opportunity. In fact, you rightly mentioned that we are in fact a bit slightly excited of the platform, what we are I am going to share with you. You know that the concept of one stop service center is not new. And in Bangladesh as well. Recently, we have the, the, the government and some private agency created numbers of such one stop service centers. And even for entrepreneurs, some new one, one stop service center we have. So, but still, we are excited because this will not be like others. One, that this is unique. And if I shortly term, it will be one stop service plus because all the in supports and issues required for any entrepreneurs, to be entrepreneurs or existing entrepreneurs, all things has been uh, considered and addressed in the proposed platform. And I must say that the platform, what we are going to launch, which has been developed with the support of UNESCO, and hopefully we'll be launching that platform upcoming in next March. It will be an advisory information, information and facilitation tech. I mean, the entrepreneur will get advisory support from the platform. They will get all types of information they require, and, and they also be facilitated for their respective services. It will be reciprocal that they will be able to communicate with us, and it will be dynamic as well with continuous improvement and and, and also the respective public and private agencies who are providing services to SMEs and entrepreneurs, I mean, they will also be integrated with the platform. And finally, it will be, though SME Foundation will be responsible for operator, management and operation of the platform, but it will be operated separately, independently, with independent and separate mentor. You know that entrepreneurial journey, it uh, it, it starts but never ends. So before, the, for to be entrepreneurs who aspire to become entrepreneurs, they have some, they do face some problems. So we also consider all those things under the proposed platform. Any women who wants to become entrepreneur, they will be able to get connected with the foundation and other service providers for uh, implementing of their uh, ideas or ventures. And if they decide that they will launch, then they will get registration support from it. And they will be able, if any face, if they face any problem in case of registration, they will get support from SV Foundation. And also after they register their business, they will be able to uh, get different capacity building supports. And they will also get access to finance and access to market. I mean, they will be able to get connected with the respective banks, banks officials, even that are not centralized, they're located in their doorstep. We'll arrange those facilities to the platform. They will be able to get you know, the low demo, the trend of the products. Their, I mean, what the manufacture or service they provide, the domestic and international market will be added. They will be able to get you know, the when the, um, I mean, you know, that one of the tools for product market is uh, participation in the fair, domestic and export fair. And we they will get you know, when the which fair will coming forward. The, so in case of access to market, in case of access to finance, even in, to make their business digitization, 
in case of, I mean, access to IT and access to technology, all the support they will be getting from the platform. And also, uh, we Mr. We'll... Sato, I apologize for my interruption. May I please kindly remind you that you have one minute left so of in your fact, remaining in time. Fact, in, fact, in fact, what I wanted to mention that through the platform, the women entrepreneurs in Bangladesh, definitely they will be beneficiaries. They will be benefited and, you know, I think this time because you know in our country perspective, government has long-term vision to achieve the vision. Women participation, women empowerment is very mandatory. It's an important thing, part an issue. So government already took different programs. So accordingly, we are also focusing more actions for women entrepreneurship development. So this platform will be very beneficial for, I mean, achieving the government goals and. SME Foundation, as, as the operator, SME Foundation already started to take different uh, supporting programs to make the platform more useful and beneficial for the women. And if I mention just uh, the information to you that in last year, in last 10 years, the women numbers of women entrepreneurs have been just doubled. It, the percentage is 126 percent. So you just imagine, and mostly people are still living in rural areas. So they will be get they able to get benefit and support so SME Foundation and other service providers through this platform. It will be just regulation. It will be just AI as I mentioned, Unigon. They will get all our supports from this platform. So I'd like to thanks to um, UNSCAP in particular for providing the supports to develop this. And hopefully through this platform, SME Foundation will be able to reach the, to the entire country to be able to serve the uh, on behalf of the government since it is a Ministry of Industries organization. So we will be served, uh, get to the uh, need of entire countries entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs, and also we will be able to serve them. And finally, though it is we term as the platform for women, but I strongly believe that the male entrepreneurs and as well, the women, the youth, every entrepreneur, irrespective male, female, they will be able to get support from, from this platform. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Setter, for your insights on how this dynamic digital platform can support the ambitions of women entrepreneurs in Bangladesh. Uh, and we wish you the best of luck with your upcoming launch of the portal. It is now my pleasure to introduce our second panelist, Ms. Carolyn Chin Perry. She is sitting right next to me here as the digital innovation leader at PwC in Singapore, where she plays an active role in the organization's diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. In recent years, Ms. Chin Perry has won awards such as the IT Woman of the Year in Asia, Asia Business Role Model of the Year, SG Top 100 Women in Tech, and 40 over 40s Inspiring Women in Singapore. And she is here today to share with us how her passion about digital inclusion and helping underrepresented communities gain digital skills has translated into results. Ms. Chin Perry, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about your extensive work on digital upskilling. The floor is yours, please. Thank you. Good morning, Excellencies and distinguished guests, as well as participants. I'm very humbled and honored to be here. Um, in my recent role as um, the Asia Pacific Digital Upskilling Leader for 17 countries in Asia Pacific for our 84,000 employees, I have overseen a number of initiatives. Um, this includes setting up a digital academy to promote uh, core digital skills for all um, our staff, not just client-facing staff, as well as um, internal staff, such as um, our personal assistants, HR, and so forth, um, to gain digital skills such as digital uh, data visualization, data wrangling, analytics, um, robotics process automation, and so forth. We also had a digital accelerator program whereby we had um, targeted a collection of good talent from across the business that do not necessarily have basic digital skills um, to have a deep dive in the immersive education around um, analytics, RPA, as well as AI, ML, to then gain these skills to disrupt our firm internally, but also to add value to our clients. 
Um, in parallel, we use our digital skills to do good and invest in co corporate social responsibilities. Some of these initiatives include helping ex-offenders coming out of prisons to integrate back into the society and workforce um, through gaining basic digital skills. This includes being able to navigate um, smartphones, understand what online scams could look like, being able to develop their CVs through a Word document, um, being able to look for jobs through online job boards, um, being able to connect with their friends and loved ones through social media, as well as understanding how to use video conferencing to attend interviews and connect with loved ones. In addition to that, we also provided free digital masterclasses to over 230 participants from various charities in Singapore alone to learn how they can actually leverage technology to help um, their charity as well as beneficiaries. This would include things like being able to understand how to use social media um, for digital uh, marketing in order to um, understand how to have a better outreach in terms of um, micro donations in addition to their usual donation profiles. Um, in addition to that, we also helped a very large and prominent international humanitarian and emergency nonprofit organization with data cleansing and accuracy of their very large volunteer database. Um, this had to the use of technology cut down the use of what was traditionally a 30% job into a 3% job because of automation. Um, now, some policies that we could consider um, in Asia Pacific would include gender budgeting. This is where we look at analyzing the expected impacts of all new government spending by gender and disadvantaged groups and restructuring revenues and expenditures to promote gender diversity, um, equality, um, and fair opportunities for underrepresented groups, especially in the areas of digital access as well as education. On top of that, another policy should include um, equality impact assessment. This is where we're looking at assessing the economic and social impacts of proposed policies and programs on different groups in society, and specifically disadvantaged or marginalized groups, um, to include proactive solutions to address underlying social inequalities. Um, additionally, considering equal gender representation and leadership is also very key. And on top of that, promoting gender equality in government, as well as supply chain procurement by supporting female-led and female-owned businesses. Um, in addition, looking at pay gap reporting, and even better, if you can include digital upskilling reporting and tracking. Uh, last but not least, looking at a disaggregated collection of data, and where we look at both the public and private sectors having to invest adequately in collecting de-identified data that is disaggregated by gender, age, sexual orientation, ethnicity, disabilities, and so forth, um, to inform effective design of future government policy and support effective workplace interventions to make work as well as digital access fairer for everyone. Thank you very much, Ms. Jean Perry. The timer didn't even come on. I think we can donate one more minute uh, for your reflections on the second round of questions then. Very articulate remarks. I was very impressed to hear about the private sector initiatives here. A great example of how we can work together and learn from the private sector. I heard about the initiatives on the Digital Academy and how talents are given opportunities to deep dive into digital innovations, and also how very concretely social media can be used for digital marketing and micro donations. But I think we here in the room have also taken note for our recommendations on a whole host of issues that you mentioned. Um, let me just reiterate a few here. The importance of gender budgeting, uh, the digital access and education in initiatives and addressing what has been mentioned several times already on the underlying social inequalities and of course pushing more people in more women into leadership uh, positions thank you once again our third panelist is miss aurora giotina garcia uh, also known probably to many here in the room as boots she is the founding chairperson and president of the Philippine Women's Economic Network, co-chair of the Philippine Business Coalition for Women Empowerment, and a focal point and former co-chair of the ASEAN Women's Entrepreneurs Network. 
She is also the chairperson of the Shareholders Association of the Philippines, vice chairperson of the Institute of Corporate Directors, and president of her own consulting firm, Mageo Consulting Incorporated. Ms. Georgine Garcia, good morning to you. With your extensive involvement in women's economic and business organizations, what policies in your experience have the greatest impact on reducing the gender digital divide? And, or perhaps you may also share with us what you think of potential future policies um, for the greatest impact. The floor is yours, Boots, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, as the case may be. And thank you for the opportunity to share my views in this panel. Let me begin by mentioning that I'd like to speak, given, given my role in the ASEAN Women Entrepreneurs Network, I'd like to speak initially from an ASEAN perspective. I just want to remind the audience that, in fact, in 2017, the ASEAN leaders adopted the action agenda on mainstreaming women in the ASEAN economic community. And in fact, one of the specific thrusts of the agenda is to promote women's participation in STEAM, including ICT, by providing incentives to women investors, allocating more investments in research and science. And of course, by creating an enabling environment to enable women entrepreneurs themselves to be ICT empowered. So this was followed then subsequently to 2017 in 2020 by another policy brief, which the ASEAN Women Entrepreneurs Network likewise uh, pursued with the Philippines Philwin as the project leader. And specifically a recommendation was made to create education programs for women, either as apprenticeship or, I, or ICT upskilling to close the gender gap and achieve a more inclusive and integrated community. So, well, it has been said many times that importantly as well, representation of women in leadership and decision-making bodies is quite critical. So I'd like to cite an example of an initiative with an ASEAN or regional perspective. And I'm talking in particular about ASEAN access. It is uh, a portal with a tagline your business information gateway to ASEAN and beyond. It's in fact an online portal serving as the first port, well, port of call for ASEAN SMEs and other businesses who are wanting or seeking information about trade and investment in ASEAN, okay? So this is overseen by the ASEAN Coordinating Committee on Small and Medium Enterprises. I would think this is a response or an action that has been taken as a result of the action agenda which the leaders adopted in 2017. And so uh, it seeks to support uh, SMEs of both genders who are wanting to, become, to go international and sell their products and services outside of our region. And I think it's a good practice that we can share that makes use of digital technology for women, okay? So the Philippine Women's Economic Network is a network partner of the Department of Trade of Industry of the Philippines. And as such, it, we are committed to promote and, and spread this around to our women entrepreneurs in the Philippines to allow them to access this portal. Okay. Now, in terms of existing policies, I'd like to mention that it was reported in 2017 that at least five of the ASEAN countries have adopted national digital economy or ICT strategies, including Brunei, Brunei, Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand, and Singapore. So these initiatives are meant to ensure that women are not left behind and are of course essential in pursuing or addressing the digital divides. And each of the different countries themselves have come up with, own, with their own strategies for addressing this. And, countries such as Indonesia, uh, in Vietnam. But I'd like to emphasize it despite, well, statistics show that uh, in a survey in 2020 of the World Economic Forum, three years after the adoption of the agenda, all our ASEAN countries are still perceived to be far, far from achieving gender parity in technology roles with Singapore and Malaysia, of course, being the best performance. And as shared by our friend from Singapore, there are initiatives that are taking place. 
Now, in my own home country, the Philippines, 60% of the population is now connected to the internet. And Filipinos use digital technology to communicate, to be informed about the latest information and content. And we, have, we do have other uh, legislation, such as the Magna Carta of Women, which is probably one of the few in the Philippines, as well the Philippine Development Plan, which was recently launched, which now seeks to put a gender lens into the policies that will be uh, pursued to address, among others, the gender digital divide. And the Department of Communications and Technologies has likewise undertaken certain projects specifically addressed to women's needs and concerns and women's need to access technology as part of our commitment as a country. So I think my time is up and I hope I've been able to share some of my of the knowledge that I have wished to share with you today. Thank you very much, Ms. Jotina Garcia, for your eloquent remarks, uh, and also for bringing the ASEAN perspective into this conversation and sharing with us some of the uh, results already achieved under the 2017 ASEAN Action Plan. While, of course, reminding us that there are still many challenges persisting and mm -hmm. a long way to go. Um, we also heard about the impact of the adoption of the Magna Carta in the Philippines, uh, a very good red threat for the future advancement of women's empowerment in the country. And uh, we have, of course, taken notes uh, from this session on the recommendations. We heard many from you, uh, just to highlight uh, the first two, uh, on education programs for women and the importance of what Malala says is one teacher, one pen, one student will eventually change the world, our world. And the second recommendation really on uh, increasing the representation of women in leadership positions. Thank you very much for your contributions to our discussions today. Our final panelist is Ms. Sarai Tevita. She is the ICT director of the National University of Samoa. She is also the current and first female president for the Samoa IT Association and a Pacific Islands Chapter Internet Society executive member, serving in the ICT field in the financial, agriculture, and education sectors in Samoa. Ms. Tavita, we already heard uh, from Ms. Anju Mangal uh, yesterday showcasing your digital gender scorecard in Samoa. May we take this opportunity to learn more about the key findings and how you think research such as this can inform policy making? Mr. Vita, please, the floor is yours. Mr. Vita, I believe you are on mute. Yep. Yeah, Talofa from Samoa. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning to all um, participants, participants online as well as uh, on board. I'm Sarai Falupurte Vita, as being introduced. And um, I would like to go straight to the questions being asked about a Pacific Digital Gender Scorecard that recently launched in 21st October 2022. And this was a digital um, first ever digital gender scorecard audits in the Pacific, where Samoa, Tonga, and BNG were selected by the World Wide Web Foundation and um, Alliance. Sorry about that. Alliance for Affordable Internet. And we were so fortunate to have the opportunity to participate in this kind of work. And Samoa IT Association was partnered with the World Wide Web Foundation to conduct research and consultation for this project. So it was, uh, I think it was a good timing, it was the right time uh, for a digital scorecard to came on board while the world is struggling to meet the technology demands of the pandemic era and gender care. So we were focusing and we were giving the five key themes which are divided into 14 indicators to assess the qualitative and quantitative state of women's digital inclusion and empowerment. So these themes are internet access and empowerment internet affordability, digital skills and education, relevant content and services for women and online safety. So we developed, for, I will talk specifically for the Samoa context. So we developed 43 
questions from the National Representative Survey across Samoa subregions with our sample size um, 500, but we managed to collect uh, 563. So we focus on women's rights online by contextualized our questionnaire using the global parameter survey. The questionnaires were uh, in both English and Samoan language, and we delivered an online we delivered it on online using the platform provided by one of our Samoa's company called SkyEye. As I mentioned before, it was during the lockdown where this survey was conducted. But thanks to the technology, thanks to the ICT means that enabled our team to continue this survey. So as a result of the survey on the digital gender scorecard for Samoa, we scored 71% achieving these five things. The five films were scored out of 10. So for the internet access empowerment, in conclusion, Samoa scored 6.5. This means that ICT data collected and available from national bodies. However, a small portion of data of this data includes sex discriminated information. So according to our data collected, about 50 to 74% of 400 females interviewed reported to look for jobs, seek info and voice opinion using the internet. So there are national policies that mention the use of technology to combat the gender inequality. However, there is no or limited official data available on specific programs implemented or is a success for women and girls. The second theme was affordability, we scored seven. This means that some more context, prices have been falling since the competition was introduced in 2007 and affordability is now at around 1.9%. So clearly it has been good for customers, but for the ITU's board plan commission proposes that internet access would only be considered affordable in least developing countries of one gigabit of internet data. That's the prepaid data, plus around 2% of cross national monthly income. So according to the March uh, 2022 quarter employment statistics report, males received the biggest share of total wages, 54.2%, or the total and only 45.8% for uh, women wages. The, the third theme, digital skills and education, that's course eight. About 70% of teachers are trained and are ICT qualified teachers in school. Although a number of ongoing ICT related workshops and trainings have been placed for teachers in summer, but there's still some loophole in the programs and that needs to be improved on. Women comprise about 30 to 40% of ICT related research developments and projects, while 65% internet coverage is available in all schools. The percentage of school or the percentage of students access to the internet at secondary schools are quite low depending on availability and the limited resources, which hinders the internet accessibility. The fourth theme was relevant and services. This caused seven, Ministry of Health and stakeholders to ensure the availability of updated information about reproductive and sexual health rights and services for women and girls online. Our Office of Enforcement has also set up an online form, which people can lodge their complaints about human rights violations, Prime Minister's referrals, public content, um, public internet complaints, and own motions, investigations, domestic violence. However, there's no dislocated data or the percentage of women personally using mobile financial services. Yet recently, there is an increase in the use of Mtala and MyCash platforms in Samoa. The last thing. The last thing. Thank you. Yeah, and the last film is the online safety. That's course seven. And that refers to the extent of which law enforcement agencies um, and the courts are taking action in cases where ICT tools are used to commit of gender-based uh, violence. So we came up uh, with five points uh, action uh, plan so that for the government can consider to close this gap. And these uh, empower women and girls through digital skills and ICT education adopt meaningful connectivity as the target for the internet use, digital skills and education, you know, integrated that basic digital literacy in school, increase awareness of relevant content um, services and review national laws and emphasize awareness. So with that uh, work we, we, we did in the, la in the last year, 
we will now be starting to call out to the relevant uh, ministries and relevant organizations to push this through as well as the government so that they consider this for way forward. Thank you. Mr. Rita, thank you very much for sharing the results of the digital gender scorecard in uh, Samoa and for so succinctly summarizing the 40 indicators of this uh, scorecard. And I am just so pleased with how this panel discussion has turned out because we have come complete full circle right now. You, with your intervention, Ms. Tivita, has demonstrated the ways in which we can make sure that data forms the basis for evidence-based informed policymaking. You have your five-point action plan. We heard as the first intervention during our introductory speaker's presentation, the ways in which the government is already launching initiatives on the basis of this data and advancing uh, and further strengthening already existing initiatives. Thank you very much once again for your contributions to this um, discussion. Now we have uh, the opportunity to hear from our panelists uh, in a second quicker round of just about three minutes. Um, in these three minutes, may I invite firstly, Ms. Tivita, to just to hear from you if there is any reflections that you have on what you already heard from the other panelists here, uh, perhaps some of the promising practices shared or some of the recommendations that were put forward. Uh, but also, um, as we have understood the wide and widening digital gender gaps, I'm hoping that we can end this discussion on a positive, uplifting note and would also like to hear you, from you and from the other panelists on what makes you hopeful about the future. How can we reduce the digital gender divide? Mr. Witzebeck, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam um, Moderator. Uh I would like to just to recommend that, that it's like an overview of what has been said. It's the lack of awareness of using the digital inclusion in any sort of sectors. And that means that we need to consider women as well in all sectors and make them involved, get them involved with what you um, are planning, what you are working for. Awareness is another way of uh, making people informed. Um, the other, the data base or the data collector that we did for our server is very helpful for making decisions. So if we have that data base and, you know, share what we have been collected, that will give more opportunities or more um, knowledge to our decision making so that there is a problem. We, def we define the issue, we define the gaps and also the actions, the action points that I just read for those gaps to be um, closed. So more awareness, change the mindset of people as this is where we're going. We are living in the cyberspace and people need to be in a cyber safety. So um, in overall, I would like to thank you again for the opportunity to convene uh, for some more, some more IT association as well as National University. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of our minister. It's good to see our minister from Samoa being the key speaker here. So hello, uh, Honorable Leota. Um, so good to see you someone here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think uh, more education to our people include the digital literacy from the beginning, you know, when they're in their early age up to, to the university level. So that when this technology involvement uh, comes, they know what to do, they know what to click. They need to think before they click something that is not, you know, it's not accessible, it's not good for them to access. So awareness, education, be inclusive, prioritize women's environment, that will go. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, leaving us with these excellent parting thoughts. Um, may I please ask Ms. Jyoti Gina uh, Garcia uh, for your final thoughts? Oh, I thought I was only to answer the second question on addition. But in any case, my suggestions are, I think that, well, just to emphasize again, is to have women seat at the table. Okay. Second, I'd like to uh, suggest as well education programs, if not uh, supplemental, compulsory on digital literacy, which is made available to all women. Third, I'd like to also call on the government 
to provide the necessary infrastructure, which is accessible, affordable, and of course, easy to use. Okay, talking about, you know, because if these are not present, uh, we can talk forever about digitalization, accessing ICT for everyone, including women. But unless we are, we have the available infrastructure and talk about telecommunications, connectivity, et cetera, available, then we will continue to experience this digital divide. Of course, as coming from the private sector, we do have a role to play as well. And I'm not putting all the responsibility on governments. The private sector can play an important role by mainstreaming gender into their human resources policy. I'm talking about not only giving equal opportunity for employment and leadership roles, but really including women in the provision of training and skills development on ICT and related fields. Because unless there is an intentional proactive effort on the part of private sector, then we will continue to talk about women being left behind, okay? Why am I hopeful? I'm hopeful at least we have policies that have been put in place, which is really an evidence of the recognition that there is a challenge and there is a gap that we need to address. However, I would wish that the implementation of projects and initiatives in support of these policies are implemented sooner rather than later. If I might say, I'd like to say, please step on the gas, okay? And unless we do so, we are moving in a very rapidly changing digital world. And unless we move at the same pace, okay, obviously we will all be left behind, which is something which we, particularly for women, would not want to have. So having said that, I'd also like to reiterate that we need an all hands on deck approach, okay? It's good to see everyone, all interested stakeholders, all those who are effective, involved in this discussion today because we cannot do this alone. We cannot operate in silos. We need to all work together. So having said that, my final point is just briefly, I'd like to, to end with this short message. We should nurture women. We should nurture, encourage, and support women in the workplace, marketplace, and communities, and share resources and networks. ICT can help women rise from a lack of power to become tech-powered and digitally literate and, importantly, economically empowered. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you very much for this final message and for really asking us to step it up for accelerated hands-on action. And I heard a shout out to the private sector there as well. So it's very fitting that I can now give the floor to Ms. Chin Perry for her final thoughts. Thank you. Um, when I think about um, reflecting on what my fellow panelists have shared, um, I agree with Mr. Nazim that it does take public and private sector to play a part. Um, I may humbly also suggest to include non-profit organizations as well in this wonderful journey. Um, also reflecting on Ms. Garcia's comments, um, you know, definitely all hands need to be on deck to make this happen. This is a very urgent and important issue that we can't just ignore conveniently. Um, great that there are lots of considerations in Philippines around digital financial and, and education inclusion. Um, and in terms of what Ms. Um, Sarai from Samoa had mentioned, um, I'm very heartened to hear that um, there is indeed a, a gender scorecard um, around the digital space. Um, now, of course, it, they're still early in their journey. Of course, there's areas of improvement as what she mentioned. However, at the same time, the scorecard allows for visibility, education, tracking, as well as looking at ways to improve. Um, so well done on that front. I'm really looking forward and I'd love to connect with you after this to see how this goes. Um, now, do I feel hopeful? Yes, I do. I am hopeful that eliminating the gender divide 
um, especially in the digital space, can be achieved in the near future. The first is the acknowledgement that this is urgent and important issue that is everyone's responsibility because we want to ensure that underrepresented groups, including women and those with special needs, do not fall behind. And we also want to avoid placing additional strain on social welfare, taxes, and potential increase in exploitation or crime due to basic needs not being met. What we really need is commitment and collaboration by public, private, and non-profit uh, organizations to make provisions for digital accessibility, from digital upskilling for all age groups, gender, and backgrounds, to the right infrastructure to, in place for high-speed internet, and to assess affordable digital devices. This can take in the form of government subsidies or, and um, provisions, um, also ensuring that the private sector contributes, um, such as telecommunication organizations um, being able to provide high-speed internet, in including um, remote locations. Also having large tech vendors repurposing used or unsold devices such as phones, laptops, and other devices to those in need. Additionally, nonprofit sectors at the grassroots levels can identify and support those in need, including women and disadvantaged groups. This is not something that's far-fetched, but it does require a considered roadmap and ongoing commitment by government, industry, and nonprofit sectors to come together to address this important, urgent issue of the digital divide. We all want the world to progress, and so that no one will be left behind in the digital age. Together, we can make this happen. Thank you. Thank you very much for these very concrete ways to accelerate uh, actions and also for giving us the sentiment of the urgency to act and to act together. Uh, our final panelist, Mr. Sato, may I please invite you uh, for your final thoughts? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, are you hearing all those uh, inputs and are you also getting this in fact, definitely? As I mentioned that, uh, what I was mentioning that this uh, common platform or virtual platform for the women entrepreneurs, uh, we are really, Confident that this will bring huge uh, changes and potential for the women entrepreneurs as well. But through this platform, I will especially we shall be especially focusing on access to finance for women entrepreneurs to digital manners. And you know that digital financing has got momentum. And uh, though still we are depending on banks for access to finance, but recently. Uh, the digital financing getting momentum and numbers of fintech agencies they have come for to address the issue particularly in last stimulus package we when implemented some stimulus package we found that the marginal group the small size of smes and women who are located throughout the country mostly in rural areas they did not get the benefits of this general package so digital financing in particular could play vital role for ensuring access to finance so SME Foundation, on behalf of the government, will take special effort for promoting this and also in, uh, supporting the fintech agencies so that they will be taking different uh, programs and initiatives for covering the women entrepreneurs in particular for uh, serving them to come, bring them in financial inclusion. Recently, the government of Bangladesh has uh, approved a financial inclusion policy under who is the all as the, following the SB, the new one lagging behind. So government has planned to uh, bring all the women entrepreneurs in the financial services. And, and that is why the digital financing has a, could play the greater role. And according to the SME Foundation, already going to create a common platform for the fintech agencies with support of the financial institution like SME dedicating banks and non-bank financial institutions. So I strongly believe that this digital financing or digital service will get momentum, but that is why we still need uh, from particular that awareness, literacy, and capacity building. If you consider our country perspective, uh, I mean, I mean, the public are still not aware, they get scared, they feel shy, or even they feel uncertainty for digital transaction. So we government uh, need to have uh, num huge numbers of awareness, literacy, and capacity building programs. Government need to provide special uh, fine, uh, policy and other tax incentive for the fintech agencies. Also, government should promote the financial institution for converting into digital financing. 
And also government uh, needs to uh, that, uh, develop in infrastructure with obviously ensuring cybersecurity. It is uh, in the last year we faced a bad experience of cybersecurity. And last of all, I must say that cost of transaction in digital is, is pretty high still in compared to others. So government also need to have um, in policy initiative to make the transaction cost in digital finance low. So uh, finally, my concluding remark is that uh, I would like to give thanks that what we are going to launch, it will definitely bring a huge impact to the government in achieving government ultimate target creation of more women employment, women empowerment, and also bringing them in the mainstream of the economy with, um, uh, so that they could play the same role as the male entrepreneurs providing. So I'd like to conclude here with giving thanks to UNESCAP and the uh, moderator and the other uh, distinguished person who has been involved with this uh, seminar. And thanks once again from SE Foundation and thanks once again from the government of Bangladesh. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sato, for highlighting the importance of innovation and for really reiterating the importance of digital financial inclusion going forward. As this concludes the response from our panelists, I will now invite our discussant, Ms. Chin Ti Huang, Deputy Director General, Agency for Enterprise Development of the Ministry of Planning and Investment in Vietnam to share her reflections on our conversation and to hear more about her experience with the role technology has played in policy making to advance a series of initiatives for women entrepreneurs. Ms. Huang has worked as a policymaker in enterprise development and has contributed to many Vietnamese government legal frameworks that support the development of small and medium enterprises. A true champion of promoting a better policy environment, not only in Vietnam, but also in the ASEAN region. Vietnam recently issued a new decree to further the implementation of the SME law and to strengthen the overall enabling environment for women entrepreneurs. This new decree was issued in response to a joint study by ESCAP and AED MPI assessing the impact of the SME law on women entrepreneurs. May you please share with us how this new decree will uh, advance further the ambitions of women entrepreneurs in Vietnam and how many entrepreneurs you anticipate will be anticipated that will be impacted by these positive legal reform. Ms. Huang, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator, and good morning, everyone. Warm greetings uh, from Vietnam. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Eska, for inviting me to join this very meaningful discussion today. And thanks a lot, our excellent panelists, for your great sharing and recommendations on advancing the women empowerment through the innovation and digital inclusion. Uh, I just want to add on some information that's supporting your uh, initiatives. Uh, the Innovation, Technology and Entrepreneurship are engines for advancing the gender equality and women's uh, empowerment by increasing the women's access to education and social economic opportunities. Empower women also benefits uh, this sector by providing the needed uh, skills and talent as well as the, the new markets, uh, especially in the context uh, of the industry uh, uh, 4.0 revolution, the climate ch challenges, and the recent uh, COVID-19 pandemic is changing the way uh, business work and strongly affect to the uh, MSMEs and women entrepreneurs. Uh, so uh, as the moderator mentioned before, uh, under the CWV project uh, with um, um, uh, managed by the uh, ISCAP, uh, Vietnam already um, uh, have uh, uh, implemented uh, several initiatives in terms of uh, policy reform. We have a new degree uh, that um, uh, enable uh, and foster the uh, women uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, and we also innovate the support uh, channels for the women SMEs in the new normal context. 
um, for example, like uh, we uh, with the support from uh, the SCAP CWE uh, project, uh, this is the one stop portal uh, for the women entrepreneurs, also designed and situated under the national SME portal of Vietnam. Uh, this uh, portal is uh, also um, uh, with the purpose to establish a digital platform fostering the women entrepreneurs across in Vietnam, exploring the greater inter-institutional uh, coordination and partnership, uh, enhancing the competitiveness of the women-led SMEs in the new normal context. Uh, this part of, based on the, um, the, the uh, research uh, with uh, SCAP, uh, for the women entrepreneur in the COVID-19 context, uh, we already designed uh, three uh, some uh, main categories under this uh, one-stop portal. Uh, for example, we introduced mm -hmm. about the policy and support programs for women, uh, innovative finance, the ICT digital transformation, e-learning platform, uh, and SME care toolkits, and especially the uh, digital healthcare uh, corner in in this portal. Uh, besides that, to enhance the women entrepreneurs in terms of ICT and technology capability, uh, under the CW project, we cooperate with SCAP to organize uh, several TOT training courses on e-commerce for the women entrepreneurs. And this year, we continue this work and will organize more training courses on the digital consultant network for the women and SME. Uh, I think that um, another important, very important initiative I want to share with you that the to create the governance uh, coordination mechanism is very important and this mechanism strengthened through the annual national advisory meetings uh, that facilitate the partnerships and policy dialogue with the uh, representatives from relevant key ministries in Vietnam and women uh, business association that uh, enabling the platform for the partnership across the policy financing and ICT. Uh, besides that, um, my ministry also implement a digital transformation program for the SME. And we are very happy that the women entrepreneurs are very actively to participate in this program. And 46% uh, of the beneficiaries from this program are women-led SMEs. Uh, we also scale up the women SME support initiatives uh, in a cross border e commerce digital. I apologize for my interruption. If I may please kindly ask you to wrap up your remarks. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. So, uh, that's the uh, I just want to, to share with you uh, some information, additional information to support uh, our panelists already discussed and a recommendation. And thank you very much. I would love to learn and share with you more uh, to advance the common entrepreneurs through the digital uh, technology and innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Huang, for sharing your experiences and insights with us, including on the SME portal and really emphasizing the importance of integrating the policy, the ICT, and the financing components to enable the uh, environment for women entrepreneurs. At this juncture, may I please thank all of our panelists and our discussions for contribution, contributing to this a section of our meeting. May you please give them a round of applause for their comments and reflections. And following this panel discussion, we will now begin the plenary discussions, which will run for the next uh, half an hour to 45 minutes. Uh, may I please remind our participants that the outcomes of this consultation will be a set of recommendations on areas for accelerated action in line with the priority theme for CSW 67. The set of recommendations will be informed by the four substantive sessions, including this session three. In the plenary discussions, government representatives are invited to share their experiences and practices, and this will be followed by perspectives from other stakeholders. So as we would like to hear from as many stakeholders as possible, we ask that all interventions please be kept to no more than two minutes. In the guidance note for participants that were circulated in advance of this meeting, we invited expressions of interest to intervene. For those joining online, you may also request the floor using the chat box, not the raised hands function. 
As we are limited on time, we may not be able to call on all participants who wish to speak during this session. Please remember that you may also request the floor in the following session after lunch and during the session on recommendations. I will now open the floor for government representatives and would like to invite Ms. Maria Filomena Babo Martins, who is the National Director of Gender Policy and Inclusion, representing the Secretary of State, Secretariat of State for Equality and Inclusion in Timor Leste. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Good morning to you and to all, everyone here in this room. Um, the Secretary of State for Equality and Inclusion mandate is to advocate, coordinate for the policies, laws, programs to be gender sensitive in the planning and budgeting. The participation uh, of uh, all women in all sectors must, must be, uh, I mean, the participation in all sectors must be equal between men and women. The Secretary of State now is advocating for the government to have quota 30% for women entrepreneurs since the, the gender norms in Timor Leste saying that um, all uh, road, buildings, uh, bridge is our ma masculine project. That's why we are now advocating uh. to have quota 30% so women entrepreneurs can access to, to those uh, projects. At the parliament, we have 40% women. Government, we have 60% women. Public administration, we have 23% women. And at, at the village level, we have 5% women. And hamlets, we have 4% women. In labor sector, we uh, Timor Leste, through the Secretariat of State, for professional training and employment. CFOP has sent workers, both men and women, to South, South Korea, Australia, to work in various fields. Through um, training center, CFOP also has increased the capacity building of young men and women to prepare themselves to be ready professional to work in various areas when needed. In social sector, the government of Timor-Leste has made efforts by providing some subsidies to community to recover their, their economic, them economically after COVID-19 and natural disaster in 2021. Timor-Leste also, through the Secretary of State of Co Cooperative, has established a cooperative from national to rural area with aim to increase economic income and improve the livelihood of the community. I thank the delegate from Timor-Leste. May I please invite Mr. Kevin Godoy, officer in charge of the Chief Economic Development, as a Chief Economic Development Specialist uh, of the National Economic and Development Authority of the Philippines to please take the floor. Uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, uh, colleagues, a pleasant morning. As we continue to embrace the digital age, it is imperative that we implement economic labor and social policies that promote gender equality and inclusiveness. Uh, in spite of the advances in technology, obviously gender digital divide ex still exists. And this gap in women and girls' digital adoption and use perpetuates inequality and limits the potential of half of our population to fully participate and reap the benefits of the digital economy. To address this issue, one of the focus areas of the current administration's Philippine Development Plan is digitalization. Under Chapter 4, it, explic it explicitly states that the government will, will robust data systems that will create better programs such as targeted social protection and more efficient employment opportunity linking systems. This will help facilitate the implementation of programs and policies that address all forms of labor, market discrimination in work, education, and training. We'll also intensify employment programs for the marginalized, disadvantaged, and vulnerable sectors. Finally, we will design mechanisms to ensure that 
inclusive participation and equitable access to education and skills development programs. Under this framework, the country will push harder to provide equal access to digital technologies, bridge the digital skills gap and promote women's entrepreneurship and leadership in the digital economy. Furthermore, we will leverage financing for inclusive digital development and gender transformative innovation by investing in programs and initiatives that promote gender responsive digital innovation and promote women's participation in the digital, digital economy. Finally, let, let us work together to create a digital world where women and girls have equal opportunities to participate, lead, and succeed. Through this, we will unlock the full potential of the digital age and build a more equitable and inclusive society for all. Thank you and uh, a good day for everyone. I thank the delegate from the Philippines. May I please invite an online intervention from Salvana Mahmoud, Principal Assistant Secretary of the Policy and Strategic Planning Division of the Ministry of Women, Family and Community Development of Malaysia, please. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Your Excellencies and distinguished guests. Malaysia has constantly strived to make incremental improvements in ensuring women are not left behind and to be included in the digital age through various strategies and initiatives. Besides legislative and policy improvements, substantive progress has reflected in the National Development Plan and federal budget to ensure better representation of women in all sectors, including economy, labor, and social sphere. The participation of women in labor force has been increasing and they are engaged in paid employment or are employers self-employed and unpaid family workers in all economic sectors. However, the rate for Malaysian women was still considered low at 55.5% in 2022. The government of Malaysia is steadfast in transforming its approach towards encouraging higher labor force participation among women. One of the key strategies is to focus on enhancing digital skills, which enables higher opportunity for hiring, especially among women returnees who left the workforce for quite some time and opens up new prospects for their participation in gig economy and entrepreneurship. Malaysia has also given emphasis in encouraging women entrepreneurs to leverage and partake in various digital economy platforms through capacity building programs run by many government agencies and missionaries, as well as special grants and microcredit facilities to support their digital-based businesses. This effort is to ensure that women are not left behind in terms of earning and income and digital technology empowerment. Malaysia will continue to play an active role regionally and internationally in ensuring women are not left behind in the digital age. We stand ready to learn from others and share best practices on the initiative to empower women. I thank you. I thank the delegate from Malaysia and would like to invite Moshida Akhtar, Deputy Secretary of the Secondary and Higher Education Division of the government of Bangladesh to please take the floor. Thank you very much, honorable chair. And thank you, distinguished participants. Uh, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. So gender equality in Bangladesh has improved with broad-based expansion. In the education sector, uh, gender disparity has been eliminated in primary and secondary education and has narrowed in tertiary education. Their education gains have led to better employment opportunities for women and increased the female labor force participation rate from 28.3% in 2000 to 36.3% in 2019. Financial inclusion has also been a very focused of Bangladesh government, Bangladesh has been trying to become an ICT-driven nation and has adopted numerous technologies to address multiple issues, including illiteracy, discrimination, and many more. And we had all, also uh, already started gender-friendly budget uh, uh, in the government sector. With rapid and big change in the IT sector, there is an increase in girls joining the sector and their access to the field. Women's employment opportunities have been created in IT sector. In just a few years, 10,500 women entrepreneurs have been created. However, Bangladesh experiences underrepresentation of women and girls in workplace and higher education in the fields of STEM. 
Bangladesh is at the very bottom in South and West Asia, only 14% involved in STEM, around 80.85% of the garment industry workforce is comprised of women. Many professional and potential women are not able to give their best deal to the fact that they are overburdened with domestic responsibilities and there are cultural, many cultural factors associated with their uh, uh, this lagging behind uh, states. Thank you so much. I thank the delegate from Bangladesh. May I please invite the delegate from Tonga to take the floor? Thank you, um, Madam Moderator. So I'm from the Ministry of Internal Affairs, Women Affairs and Gender Equality Division, and I'm very pleased to be taking the floor here, uh, representing um, one of the countries from the Pacific, and I'd like to congratulate the Minister from Samoa, as well as the other representative from the ITC Women's Network. I would firstly like to, to refer um, to the um, vulnerability of women in, um, in general. And, and this was, if you recall from last year, January 15th, there was a, a tsunami, volcanic eruption in Tonga. A tsunami and um, ash fall, which um, damaged up to 86% of, uh, of, of the country. Three out of the four mortalities were women. Referring to the IDA, you will see that you will see that high percentages of women were female headed households in damaged houses as well as affected households. So I just want to, to put that out there so that you could have a feel of um, the vulnerabilities, um, the impacts of climate change on small island um, countries. With regards to the, um, the theme, I'm very pleased to, um, to say that with, with the theme, it makes small countries like Tonga address the gaps of um, the, the digital um, innovation on, on digital and uh, technological change and education and the impact on women and girls. With, with all the discussions in the panels yesterday, I'd like to put out there the, um, the affordability, the accessibility, and the availability of devices. Um, I would like to put on the floor here the, the call for, the, for, um, for collaborative partnership to support um, small islands such as Tonga, as Samo had referred to. So I, I, I know I've run out of time, but the time that I have, those are the three areas that I do think that we should consider in this consultation the accessibility, the affordability, and the availability of devices, um, especially to remote and outer islands um, places. Th there is also um, initiatives with regards to, to women in entrepreneurship with the use increasingly now for the use of the technology um, online. So this would, we would like to, um, to have this in, in the recommendation, support for women, women in entrepreneurship um, for online handicraft um, marketing. With Tonga, we have the Computer Crimes Act and we have pending bills on cybersecurity. And I'm so pleased, um, Madam Moderator, to hear from yesterday and today that the, um, 
the scorecard for, for the region, including the island of Tonga, is um, being discussed in this forum. So I would like to say that in Tonga, the women in ICT, they've just been designated last year, but I would say that they are quite visible and we do hope that with government, we would be able to, to partnership, build a partnership and strategies for a way forward. With regards to gender availability, that is also a big issue, especially with STEM and, um, I and the participation. I apologize for my interrupting your remarks. If I may kindly ask you to wrap up, please. So the collection of data with regards to women's participation in ICT and the gaps, I would also like to recommend that that would be included in the, the text in, in our, um, our report for the recommendations. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the delegate from Tonga. May I please invite the delegate from Cambodia to take the floor? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and good morning, distinguished guests and speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, um, on behalf of the Ministry of Women Affairs and Cambodian National Council for Women, allow me to share Cambodian context in line with this session. I just brief with the economic size. Uh, in Cambodia, uh, in economic sector, women participation level and have now become support a source of long-term economic, family, and social economy growth. In Cambodia, we have the women account for 84% or level four, and among all those, 61% are business owner and entrepreneur, which is the high rate in the region. In this regard, we also request for design and environmental friendly and sustainable ecosystem that will ensure that support to micro and small and medium enterprises, especially for women role in digital economy and expansion of human rights resources, development program, promoting upskill and reskilling training for women and girls and engage them to see how new employment and career opportunity in line with the market and especially for digital uh, movement. To support this, the commitment of the government, we will be looking for uh, gap of the uh, gender gap, you have to uh, remove from the article like first is gender gap in the digital gap and access to digital asset. Second, gender gap in financial literacy and access to finance and third, digital gap in social protection, access to health and as well as economic care, unpaid uh, domestic care. For is a gap a gender gap in labor market and wage employment and education, especially for STEM, uh, file and skill development. I just highlight that um, at the moment we have some achievement to create a national uh, council for science, technology, innovation, and we are also established for entrepreneur development center focused for small, mid, uh, micro, and medium enterprises for women. And also, um, we, launched, we just launched for e-commerce strategy, which is the leading by Ministry of Commerce. And one other strategy to improve digital entrepreneur support for e-commerce startup, also for young women. <laughs> and other activity is leading with by the uh, 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 technical ministry and ministry uh, policy have uh, to be putting in place. And I would like to, to uh, thank for the, the government has support all the uh, gender promoting in the all level and uh, all sector, which is uh, regarding with the uh, social economy development. And finally, we, I have some uh, two recommendations. This is a gender and inclusive responsive policy in ITC and technology should be continued to invest in ITC technology for women and girls and strengthening capacity and public sector provider inclusive and gender responsive ICT in line with international norm. And thank you. I thank the delegate from Cambodia. May I please invite the delegate from Bangladesh to take the floor? 
Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, actually, in the, I'd like to put some light uh, regarding the government's initiative during the COVID pandemic. We have see, uh, seen that uh, during the COVID pandemic, the whole world, particularly the women, marginalized women, they have suffered a lot. Uh, so the government announced a special stimulus package uh, for the women in Bangladesh. And uh, out of this um, uh, stimulus package, 1,005 crore uh, taka was reserved for women where women, uh, female entrepreneurs have received loan at subsidized rate. Out of this 1,500 uh, crore uh, stimulus package, 100 crore was spe specially dedicated for the uh, Joita Foundation, that is an uh, uh, organization under, that works under the Ministry of Women and Children Affairs. Also, the government has um, taken state initiatives to uh, provide transfer through the mobile uh, financial trans uh, um, uh, transfer. And uh, the government spends around 3% of the, um, the social safety net program through the, uh, of the budget. And uh, out of these 25 schemes, um, the, all the schemes were digitalized and all cash transfers were made uh, through the mobile transfer. And as a result, out of, um, uh, out of 188 million uh, mobile users uh, in, in the last three years, um, the male uh, participation, the, uh, the women uh, uh, mobile users, um, MFS users has increased 2.5 times compared to the uh, men which were 3%. So uh, this is also closing the gender gaps and also empowering women during this uh, pandemic. Thank you very much. I thank the delegate from Bangladesh. May I please invite Shamala Chandra Sekaran Program Manager with the Asian Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women to take the floor. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I'm Shamla, and I'm pleased to be here representing the Asian Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women, ARO. Reflecting on the panel today to ensure women are not left behind, it is of utmost priority to ensure that women and girls in all their diversity are able to exercise their sexual and reproductive health and rights without coercion, violence, and discrimination. The cultural context in most Asian countries prevents young people, including young women and girls, from being educated on this topic via reliable sources. The lack of access to CSE is highly concerning as evidence proves that access to accurate, age-appropriate information on young people's SRHR is important to ensure their physical, social, emotional health and well-being and development. The importance of CSE was also highlighted in the Civil Society Forum. While digitalization makes CSE more accessible, it is not necessarily true for many young women and girls, especially for those from rural areas with disabilities and lower socioeconomic backgrounds who do not have access to the internet and digital technologies, as well as those with low digital literacy levels. Despite that existing international agreements, including the ICPD, Beijing, and the SDGs strongly recommend for member states to guarantee the right to CSE, access to CSE remains a challenge for many young women and girls in this region. Therefore, we urge member states to ensure innovative and technological advances made in both digital and SRHR information and services, including digitalized CSE, are accessible to women and girls in all their diversity. Close digital divide by increasing the digital literacy of women and girls, especially those from rural areas, those with disabilities, and lower socioeconomic backgrounds. With the increase in digital-based CSE delivery investments, including time and resources for strong monitoring and evaluation tools, are to be prioritized to capture the impact of these innovative strategies and to confirm that the needs of young women and girls are being met. Lastly, implement policies that remove barriers to education for young women and girls, including to enroll those who dropped out of school due to the pandemic back in the education system and have access to CSE. Thank you for this opportunity. I thank the representative from Arrow. May I please invite Jean Rodriguez, research staff of the Ecumenical Institute for Labor, Education, and research in the Philippines to please take the floor. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, everyone. It is a privilege to share our agreed recommendations from the recently concluded Asia Pacific Civil Society Forum. Even prior to digitalization, women workers have been confronted with challenges in relation to slave wages, unfair labor practices, lack of social protections, sexual harassment in the workplace, unsafe labor conditions, unabated attacks against union organizers and labor rights defenders. The rise of digitalization has only exacerbated most of these conditions and created another level of exploitation for women workers. 
Digitalization becomes fertile ground in shifting the nature of employment relationships, most visibly seen in the rise of the gig or platform economy in the past decade. Lack of transparency and algorithms alongside the informalization of work introduces insecure employment status under the pretense of flexible arrangements, which work to further legitimize unfair worker treatment in the absence of employer-employee relationships. It is also worth noting that work precarity does not exclusively occur in online platforms. Women in the supply chain who labor for the production of technologies and data, such as those in the electronics industry in the Philippines, are subjected to worse conditions. Digital platforms have also been used by governments and corporations to curtail, to curtail the rights and enact cyber violence and digital surveillance against women union leaders and labor rights defenders, leading to harassment, enforced disappearances, arrests, and even killings. Despite this, women workers continue to organize themselves to collectively resist and assert their rights. In this note, we make the following recommendations to achieve genuine, inclusive, and transformative digital development. Provide appropriate proportionate wages and social security benefits for women workers, including those in the platform gig economy, pass and or repeal domestic labor laws to properly address the gender specific issues and needs of women workers, including the provision of childcare infrastructure. Ensure accountability and transparency on unfair labor practices and violations of labor rights. Safeguard women workers against exploitation and global capitalist interests. Regulate e-commerce and the platform economy to adapt people-centered regulation that prevents monopolization and worsening labor flexibilization in the digital environment. Provide full employment status with benefits to platform workers and ensure humane working conditions. Ratify the ILO Convention 190 among member states to ensure the protection of women and the LGBTQ plus community against all forms of harassment and gender-based violence in the workplace, including the digital spaces. Recognize and uphold the rights of women workers to organize and form unions and associations. Promote and uphold the rights of women workers to equal and equitable resources. And finally, ensure independent, impartial, and effective investigations of all forms of attacks against union leaders, labor organizers, and labor rights defenders. Thank you for this opportunity. I thank the representative from the Ecumenical Institute for Labor, Education, and Research. May I please invite Mariam Shakila, Vice President for Maldives Chapter of the South Asia Women's Development Forum to please take the floor. Mariam Shakila on Zoom, joining us online for an intervention. As we are already running over time, may I move or do we have a connection now? Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and then uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to embrace a technology and create a digital economy that would benefit women, a cultural shift needs to occur for women to gain confidence and to enter the tech industry and become not only professionals in the field, but also advance towards digital entrepreneurship and gain entrepreneurial um, um, benefits. And such a cultural and mental shift to encourage and draw females as digital entrepreneurs, um, we believe requires an enabling environment to be created both through public policy by governments through various organizations and the tech industry itself and then so the inclusion of women in the digital environment is everyone's responsibility and hence uh, our focus at the moment is basically concentrating on uh, encourage service economy in South Asia to shift gears to digital technology for a sustainable future and then also for a greener planet and then so how digital economy can empower women and address the environmental challenges and the um, and then so um, the suggestions uh, from our organization is basically uh, to create awareness and conversation, bringing awareness to the gender gap and starting a conversation to bring life to the issue like we are doing here uh, right now and create opportunities for mentorship, conduct sessions on professional development and leadership training to give women the opportunity to develop the necessary skills, build a strong innovative culture that celebrates gender diversity and promotes gender equality, offer opportunities for, uh, for women and girls to pursue education in STEM fields and give them exposure to the different career paths and to encourage more women in the tech sector because it will help address the issues women face and can lead to more women tech 
entrepreneurs. And furthermore, and these women will build experience uh, to uh, later um, uh, to later start their own tech startups and facilitate to upskill women digitally with tech uh, e um, ed tech solutions. And women entrepreneurs need to upskill fast and encourage and push uh, towards boardroom representation for women to expose them to more leadership roles. Globally, women hold around 17%, as you know. So women tech role models have to be promoted to empower the next generation of women to enter the tech sector. Uh, so there are three key regulatory areas that, if not properly addressed, will affect digital entrepreneurship, especially due to the global nature of digital space. There are product development regulations, uh, regulations for business entry and foreign entry, public um, ownership, vertical integration, and price regulations, competition policy, and regulator, uh, uh, regulatory harmonization across jurisdictions so that digital entrepreneurs can um, operate relatively seamlessly across jurisdictions. And other policies that we recommend um, uh, include providing universal, affordable, secure, and open broadband internet access so that uh, women can improve their access to funds, opportunities, clients, partnerships, and suppliers, embed digital entrepreneurship modules in entrepreneurship education to foster female digital literacy and help female uh, students develop digital and entrepreneurship skills, encourage more women to enter tertiary education and STEM fields, and help women to complement their social skills in higher education and advanced digital skills, and support the development of digital entrepreneurship skills, facilitate inclusive culture towards digital startups and web-based female entrepreneurship, improve access to finance and resources for digital entrepreneurship and digitalization through innovative digital finance tools, facilitate peer learning to build strong networks, altering regulatory environment to fit digital space. After all, existing regulations have largely been implemented for non-digital industries and may stifle digital entrepreneurship. Establish an early warning system for potential adverse effects of digitization on gender. Redesign existing government programs to foster women's economic and digital inclusion. Popularize innovative web-based instruments and high quality online platforms to foster women's entrepreneurship skills. Combat the stereotype that digital entrepreneurs are young female, young males by showcasing a wide range of role models and success stories in entrepreneurship campaigns and entrepreneurship education, design tailored digital entrepreneurship schemes for women so that they convert uh, participants into role models and ambassadors after successful completion of the in initiative, collect more gender and age disaggregated data on the digital economy and digital self-employment employment, offer digital entrepreneurship training programs for women, uh, support and promote crowdfunding platforms to improve access to startup financial for digital entrepreneurs, particularly women and youth, use uh, um, award programs to provide small grants and visibility to digital entrepreneurs, use the application and selection process to provide workshops on key topics. I apologize for balance. my interruption. If I may kindly ask you to wrap up your intervention. Yes, just, just wrapping up and promote gender balance in the financial sector, especially those receiving public funding. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. From us, and I'm from South Asia Women's Development Forum, Vice President uh, for the uh, Maldives chapter. Thank you. I thank the representative from the South Asia Women's Development Forum. May I please invite also online Ramona Miranda from Duryok Nivaran, Gender Stakeholder Group of the Asia Pacific Partnership on Disaster Risk Reduction to please take the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. As the various speakers have said, with opportunities and environment provided for women to engage, just in the last decade, huge strides have been made in the economic uh, sphere. For example, women enterprises, uh, entrepreneurs have doubled at least. In general, these aspects, the various aspects that need to be considered, uh, uh, which are important to be considered, are knowing the data, making these women to be part of the solutions, engaging them in being the online change makers, creating the know-how to access various financing options, except especially digital financing, are some of the aspects that were discussed today. In, terms of cri in times of crisis, women tend to suffer the impacts more, as we all know. We saw how women entrepreneurs were most affected 
during the COVID pandemic. Uh, online access also suffers in these times. So what are some of the buffers that can be created? In finance, we talk about social safeguards. Uh, are there equivalent safeguards to ensure access to the online digital spaces? What policy measures can support this? Trusting that these discussions, the negotiations going forward into uh, CSW will dwell further into new ideas and innovative solutions in these aspects. Thank you. Thank you very much to the representative from Duryok Nivaran. Distinguished representatives, civil society partners, United Nations colleagues, many thanks to all uh, for your contributions to our discussions through this plenary session. This concludes this segment. May I just remind you that the summary recommendations from each of the four substantive sessions will be presented um, during the fifth session on recommendations, which will take place today at 2.30 p.m. During this session, comments on the draft recommendations will be welcomed and the meeting report, including the recommendations, will be shared with all participants in due time. May I please hand over the floor to our MC. Let's give them a round of applause for session three. Um, so yes, thank you, Ms. Oguzan and all of our panelists for your insights and for our participants who gave remarks during the plenary discussions. We will now take a short break before returning for session four at 11.30. Coffee and tea are available outside of the reception hall. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished participants and guests. Welcome back. We will now commence our fourth session on addressing online and technology facilitated gender based violence and discrimination and protecting the rights of women and girls online. Let me introduce our moderator, Ms. Melissa Alvarado, Program Manager at Ending Violence Against Women, UN Women Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Ms. Alvarado, the floor is yours. Distinguished representatives, civil society partners, United Nations colleagues, welcome to the panel discussion for session four, addressing online and technology facilitated gender-based violence and discrimination uh, to protect the rights of women and girls online. I'm Melissa Alvarado uh, with UN Women's Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, where I lead UN Women's Ending Violence Against Women uh, Regional Program for Asia and the Pacific. I will co-moderate today's panel with my colleague, Galani Duressa, at my right, Regional Program Advisor, AI, for UNFPA's Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. The digital world holds enormous potential to empower women and girls and help close the gender gap. However, at the same time, the digital world has also given rise to new forms and manifestations of gender-based violence against women and girls. There is a continuum between online and offline gender-based violence, with technology often aggravating the level of surveillance, trafficking, or physical violence perpetrated. Without gender responsive prevention, and response mechanisms in place, technology may work as a powerful tool to exacerbate gender-based violence against women and girls and widen pre-existing gender inequalities. In today's session, we will discuss the challenges and promising practices and recommend ways forward in addressing online and technology-facilitated gender-based violence. We will begin with an introductory presentation followed by a panel discussion and end with plenary interventions from participants similar to other panels in, in these two days sessions. We are delighted to have distinguished panelists from the government and civil society, each of whom has immense experience in protecting the rights of women and girls and ending gender-based violence, including through online violence uh, prevention and response mechanisms. We are honored to be joined today by Julie Inman Grant, e-safety commissioner of the government of Australia, 
who has extensive experience in the nonprofit and government sectors and spent two decades working in senior public policy and safety roles in the tech industry at Microsoft, Twitter, and Adobe. She currently leads the world's first government regulatory agency committed to keeping its citizens safer online. We will have two opportunities to hear from Ms. Grant today. I'm going to introduce the full panel now, and then I will invite uh, Commissioner Grant to present. We are honored to be joined today also by Mr. Tawhidul Islam, uh, who is the Special Superintendent of Police, Cybercrime and Operations uh, from the Bangladesh Police. He has more than 10 years of experience working on the protection of women and girls in Bangladesh, uh, in uh, the Congo, as well as South Sudan. In his current function, he is the Special Superintendent of Police for Cybercrime under the Criminal Investigations Department in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and is responsible for investigating cyber-related crimes, including online gender-based violence and social media monitoring. We will be pleased to hear from him during the panel. We are honored to be also joined today by Nigat Dodd, the founder and executive director of Digital Rights Foundation in Pakistan, a Lahore-based nonprofit working on issues of online free speech, privacy, and digital safety. She has been working for over a decade on issues of online content moderation, advocating with governments and tech companies to tackle online violence against women, minorities, and other vulnerable groups, and is currently serving as a member of the Meta, or Facebook, Independent Oversight Board. We are honored also to be joined today by Dita Katarani, the founder of the Purple Code Collective in Indonesia, a feminist collective that focuses on the intersectional issues of feminism and technology and prevents and responds to online gender-based violence, as well as assisting victims and survivors. She's a feminist activist who's been deeply involved in the social justice movement in Indonesia for many years. I'm honored to now invite Ms. Julie Inman Grant, Australia's eSafety Commissioner, who will deliver an overview presentation on online and technology facilitated gender based violence against women and girls. Commissioner Grant, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, and thank you for that kind introduction um, and for the invitation to speak on this important panel. As Australia's eSafety Commissioner, as you said, I lead the world's first government online safety regulator dedicated to protecting Australian citizens from a range of online harms. Next slide, please. Through our individual complaint schemes, we see the terrible impact of technology-facilitated gender-based violence every single day. 70% of the online harms reported to us relate to gendered violence. Two-thirds of the complaints about child cyberbullying, image-based abuse, including sexual extortion, and other forms of cyber abuse come from women and girls. And shockingly, 84% of the victims of grooming offenses are girls. We also know that online abuse manifests differently against women than it does men. It tends to be sexualized, violent, and may include rape threats or threats to kill a woman's children. But we also see commentary around a woman's appearance, supposed virtue, and even fertility. We also hear harrowing firsthand accounts from first responders, health and other support workers about severe technology facilitated abuse as an extension of domestic and family violence, who we assist through our training programs and resources. Through our engagement with partners in the region, we're also aware of a similar pattern of technology facilitated gender-based violence across the Asia Pacific. Now the impacts of online harassment and abuse can also go far beyond the immediate impacts often resulting in women feeling unsafe online, which causes them to withdraw and self-censor. Just yesterday for Safer Internet Day, we released new data saying that one in three Australians who receive abuse say it affects them mentally and emotionally. And one in six says that it does impact them physically as well. So these digital stones can break our bones. And that of course is the intent. The result is a world in which we see many women not fully participating in public debate and discourse and then missing out on educational, occupational and economic opportunities. Technology has become so intertwined in all aspects of our lives that it's no longer a novelty, but rather an essential utility. 
The idea that half the population finds itself excluded from participating fully in this connected world is simply unacceptable and makes the job of tackling gender-based violence online an issue not just about safety, but also about equity. Now is an important time to reflect on the priority theme for the 67th session of the Commission on the Status of Women this year. We know that digital innovation can be an incredible driver for economic growth and opportunity, but we also know this innovation cannot reach its full potential if the equal participation of women and girls is not supported and if their rights across all digital spaces are not safeguarded. So working together to create systemic responses to technology facilitated gender-based violence will be crucial to progressing our shared goals under the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, the 2019 Asia Pacific Declaration on Advancing Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Next slide, please. So in Australia, we've been re regulating the online world and protecting Australians from a range of online harms for almost eight years. When we were created in 2015, there was no playbook for online safety regulation, so we've had to fill in the pages as we've gone along. But today, we've developed a successful regulatory model and some of the strongest online safety protections of any country anywhere in the world. Through this model, we take a harms-based approach to everything we do, and this includes protecting Australian citizens from technology-facilitated gender-based violence. Next slide, please. Under Australia's Online Safety Act, eSafety employs a powerful combination of functions we like to call the three Ps. And these include preventions through evidence-based research, education programs, and awareness raising, protection from online harms through various regulatory and reporting schemes, and what I call proactive and systemic change, where we're working to encourage industry to take a safety by design approach as to how they develop and design their products with user safety at the core, but also anticipating technology changes and how they might be misused. But there's also a fourth P, partnerships, which is rapidly growing in importance as more countries, regions, and jurisdictions look to more regulation of online spaces and to address the issues of technology facilitated gender violence. At eSafety, we've had the opportunity to share the learnings of this model with partners throughout the world, including the Asia Pacific region, through our capacity building projects. These include our eSafety Women in the Pacific project, which works with online safety partners and women's services in the Pacific to build the capacity of domestic and family violence workers to respond to technology facilitated gender violence. We also have a second capacity building program that takes the learnings of our safety by design initiative to the digital environments in Southeast Asia, working with governments, tech companies, and civil society to embed safety from the beginning of the design process rather than retrofitting after the damage has been done. And in these projects, we've seen the value of survivor-centered, intersectional, multi-stakeholder, and localized programs that support and build on the phenomenal work that so many of you attending here today are already doing in the region. Next slide, please. Tangible action to address technology-facilitated gender-based violence is, of course, crucial, especially when you consider the global prevalence of online violence against women sits at a staggering 85%. Emerging evidence from the Asia Pacific reflects this growing prevalence of different forms of technology facilitated gender-based violence with high rates of online bullying and abuse, sexual harassment and extortion, cyber stalking, doxing, and online sexual ex exploitation evident in many Asian countries. Women in the Pacific are also less likely to have access to the internet and they're also less likely to possess the digital skills necessary to protect themselves when they're online compared to women in many other parts of the world. So while there is a need for more evidence in the Pacific, our partners across women's crises and frontline services are increasingly seeing the ways in which technology is being used to perpetuate and extend many forms of gender-based violence in the region. The emerging evidence has also shown that it is women and girls with limited digital literacy and skills who are most at risk. So our responses must address the interlinked issues of digital literacy, economic empowerment, and online safety. And while there has been progress in the region with the midterm review of the ASEAN Regional Plan on Action on the Elimination of Violence Against Women, noting that the expansion of legislative mechanisms to respond to online harms such as harassment. 
Now, as a government regulator in Australia, we can't right all the wrongs of the internet or of humanity, but we can instead act as an important safety net for Australians when they have nowhere else to turn to. But our approach to online safety also seeks to balance a range of fundamental but sometimes competing human rights. And we believe that these inherent tensions need to be balanced carefully and appropriately. It's fundamentally important that we all have a voice, both in the real world and online, but it can't just be those with the loudest voices or those who hold the biggest megaphones who are heard at the expense of all others. After all, an equal vote and an equal voice is what true democracy is all about, and I'd argue is its greatest gift. But we've seen time and again that when online discourse veers into the area of online abuse, hatred, misogyny, and violence, it can have a silencing effect on the person or group on the receiving end, which is precisely what it's intended to do. And this ultimately impinges on their fundamental right to have their voice heard and to exist online free from online violence and abuse. So protecting the voices of women, girls, and gender diverse groups from technology facilitated gender-based violence is key to ensuring that their voices continue to be heard and that they feel confident to participate in society without fear of online retribution. And to this end, we know that industry must do more. In fact, 82% of Australians see it as the tech industry's responsibility to keep them safer online. What we at eSafety want to see is technology companies stepping up to protect, empower, and to support women online. Advocating changes in how technology companies respond to online violence and how they design online platform goes simply beyond focusing on teaching users to be safe online. Systemic changes are necessary to highlight and address issues such as linguistic and cultural bias on some platforms, which do not process complaints in diverse languages and do not always recognize the importance of cultural context when responding to abuse. Next slide, please. And of course, much of our work is underpinned by strategic partnerships and collaboration, both local and global, like our founding membership of the Global Partnership for Action on Gender-Based Online Harassment and Abuse a multi-country coalition working to prioritize, understand, prevent, and address the growing scourge of technology-facilitated gender-based violence. The Global Partnership is shining a light on the violence faced by women online and the threats this violence poses to democracy and upholding human rights online. The Global Partnership is set to release a white paper on strengthening the evidence base on technology-facilitated gender-based violence in March of this year. And this will support the work that the UN women and others are doing to advance a shared definition of technology facilitated gender-based violence. Last slide, please. I'm thrilled to be part of Australia's delegation to the 67th session on the commission and the status of women. Drawing on our partnerships in the region, I believe that we must work together to promote the rights of women and girls, gender diverse and other marginalized groups to freedom of speech, participation and safety in digital spaces. We should also recognize that technology facilitated gender-based violence poses a fundamental threat to women's economic empowerment, digital inclusion, and full participation in society. Gender transformative online safety measures and safeguards should be integrated into strategies for digital innovation, digital inclusion, and women's economic empowerment. And of course, we must call on the technology industry to play their part in addressing technology facilitated gender based violence. Thank you so much for allowing me to be included in this discussion and I look forward to hearing from this fantastic panel and from those in the session. Thank you. Thank you so much Commissioner Grant for this overview and for providing us uh, some key uh standards information and strategies related to how australia is approaching this issue we really appreciate your insights i wanted to before we move on to the panel highlight some of the things that really stood out from your presentation and which i think we'll be connecting to across this panel uh, first um, you have acknowledged and underlined the importance of recognizing that uh, online gender-based violence also has offline consequences and presents very real, very physical, very personal, real-life consequences and harms to, to some survivors. 
And I think that that's an important point that we are connecting across the session today. You've also highlighted uh, the importance of prevention. And I think that that's something that we'd like to hear more from you uh, in, the, in the panel intervention uh, today, because that's such a, an important frontier issue where we're really learning more and learning more from practice there. Um, you have highlighted the important strategic uh, angle of gen taking a gender transformative approach to online safety measures and various interventions related to addressing this type of violence. Um, and you've also acknowledged that we need to be taking uh, into account the diversity of users of different populations that have special needs. And so I think that that's something that um, we hope will be uh, also highlighted throughout this panel today. So thank you for starting us off with those key areas and those key angles in, this, in today's discussion. Uh, finally, your, your referencing uh, the global partnership is quite valuable and, and how that can uh, play a role in, in guiding us all as we move forward collectively across uh, this region in particular and to do so in an evidence-based way. So thank you so much for those uh, insights that you brought to us. So in our next uh, part of this session, we will begin the panel discussion. Each panelist will be invited to respond uh, to a question. You will have five or six minutes to answer the first question. Each, each of the four panelists will, will be able to answer a question. Um, after that, uh, depending on time, if everyone keeps to time and allows us, then we will be able to return to each of you and hear for an additional two minute reflection on what the other panelists have provided and in case there's something you'd like to add to the discussion or to build on what someone else has said. So as we move into the panel, I want to then return to first panelist, uh, Commissioner Grant. And in, in this, in this uh, se segment, I'd like to invite you to tell us a little bit more about some of the emerging key issues that your office is prioritizing uh, and, and really speak to the issue of prevention, if you will. Um, how should prevention work be designed and implemented, noting this interplay between online and offline violence? I hand the floor back to Commissioner Grant. Thank you so much. Um, well, we set up our eSafety Women program, which is um, targeting frontline domestic workers um, who are helping women who are experiencing technology facilitated abuse as an extension of family and domestic violence. And as you noted in your opening um, statement, um, you know, this is a form of coercive control and it could take the form of gaslighting, surveillance, in fact, at, at one point, um, we were hearing from um, women experiencing technology facilitated abuse that they were receiving abuse through um, online child support payments uh, through banking transactions, what we call microaggressions. So we took that to um, some of the major banks in, in, in Australia. Uh, they were horrified. Um, they took a close look at it, used our safety by design proposals, and then started applying um, artificial intelligence and natural language processing to pick up these um, microaggressions and have you know really effectively prevented these from happening. Um, so we're constantly hearing about different creative ways that people can misuse technologies, whether it's a car not uh, stalling when it goes a kilometer beyond um, a woman's home or drones flying over safe, safe houses, the vast majority of technology facilitated abuse is low tech and you know could be in the the form of um, abuse through texts or dms um, or surveillance through gps on phones so we're really focused on not only reaching um, frontline domestic workers with this training about how to identify it and then how to stop it but also for um, women out there and we have to be very careful about how we do that because we don't want to provide um, a blueprint for um, those who might want to harass and abuse women um, to, to use that as a, as a blueprint. In about 2018, um, we really started to notice that um, women in the public eye, those who are politicians, journalists, um, advocates, and, and, and others, were really um, experiencing some of the most um, extreme forms of misogynistic abuse. So we started a different program called Women in the Spotlight. 
Um, and interestingly, we had people say to us, well, why are you just helping privileged women? I said, well, actually, there's a situational vulnerability here that when you're a leader and you're putting yourself out there, that doesn't mean you, you, you're making yourself ripe, ripe for abuse, um, but that was what was happening. So we've developed um, this WITS program and we now deliver social media self-defense training um, to politicians, to journalists, to people, to women in sport, to advocates. Uh, we just um, delivered it this week to a bunch of ambassadors who are using social media to engage in digital diplomacy and we're also experiencing uh, online harassment. So we know that technology can be a great leveler um, and can promote women's voices, but if we aren't protecting them too, um, then um, we're undermining um, you know, all the promise of, of that technology. So part of it is through this um, so social media self-defense and how to use tools like blocking, muting, um, and reporting, um, and you know, letting them know when to apply. But every technology platform is different. So we actually use some hands-on um, training so that, that people can be comfortable using um, all of those tools. Um, as I also mentioned, we, we do a lot of research so that we can also measure the impact um, uh, upon people and understand how online targeted abuse is manifesting. Uh, we know that one in three professional Australian women has experienced online abuse in the course of, of just doing their work and that one in four will not take leadership positions that re require them to be online. And as you say, that is in, in entrenching gender inequality, particularly because it's not really an option for, for many women in, in professional, professional fields not to have some kind of online presence. So uh, we need to make that aware. We need to understand the drivers. Now, we, we asked um, Australians, one in six told us this week that they have engaged in some kind of bad behavior online. We've asked why. Um, some of them have said for fun and amusement um, uh, because they feel that they, should, they can say anything they want um, or to publicly um, shame, or embarrass, or hurt a target. Um, and, and that's why we're trying to also ma manage the impacts so that we can really make people aware of this disinhibition effect and that, that online harassment really does have serious individual society and societal harms. I just say that that also we're seeing this right now in Australia playing out on um, dating dating sites. So we're doing some inquiries with the um, dating platforms um, where sexual assault and unfortunately um, um, a, a murder um, has has trans transpired following a meeting on on a dating site to really understand um, what these platforms are doing to make reporting easy easier. How they're picking up signals when somebody is um, engaging in sexual harassment or sexual assault to prevent them from creating additional uh, accounts to target uh, other women. Um, there are a whole other range of ideas that are being thrown around, around uh, sex offender registries and ADOs. Um, but, but really, I, I think we need to start with the prevention first and you know encouraging people to question everything and engage in safe dating practices. And finally, we're just thinking about how some of these new paradigm shifts may really um, disproportionately impact women. So when we think about the metaverse and a high sensory, hyper-realistic um, 3D environment where we may be wearing haptic suits, that could make um, sexualized conduct and content uh, and um, sexual assault or sexual harassment in that world feel very, very real. And we worry that the harms would be um, escalated. Um, and we talk about this uh, Web 3.0 world where um, all gatekeepers are disintermediated. Well, what does that mean for remediating harm? We need to be thinking about how these new paradigm shifts, whether it's generative AI or quantum, could be weaponized or misused to, to hurt women and others and build the safety protections in upfront. Thank you so much, Commissioner Grant, for these additional insights. I think what you've just done is you've illustrated for us uh, with some very clear and concrete examples about how complex and diverse this, the challenges are, the spaces uh, where these types of harms happen. You've talked about uh, through banking apps, you've talked through you know banking services, you've talked about um, dating sites, you've talked about the metaverse and the workplace, the online world of work. 
um, and uh, and and how technology is used to to control uh, individuals in intimate partner relationships as well, right? So it's not just we're not just talking about social media uh, shaming or or social media context online. So thank you so much for for underlining these points. Um, I take your your comments related to understanding the drivers of violence and and that we know is really critical to helping us understand what do we need to do to 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 unlearn to relearn to change those social norms around what is acceptable um, and and to and, and to understand what is violence and how do we change our, our behavior related to that so thank you so much for for what you've offered I'm so excited to um, to, to hear from the rest of the panel so I want to turn to the next panelist now uh, we have next uh, Mr. Tawhid, uh, who will be offering insights from the Bangladesh police experience. So I have a question for you. Uh, based on your experience, what have you learned is essential in responding to online and technology facilitated gender-based violence? And what is needed to ensure effective law enforcement for this issue? What has enabled more effective cooperation between the Bangladesh police and government and some of the internet in intermediaries to address this type of violence, of online and technology facilitated violence. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. It's an immense opportunity to express uh, our, our views on con context, uh, context of Bangladesh on online gender-based violence. Uh, good morning, everybody uh, who are on online and on board right now. Dear participants or audience, in Bangladesh, online gender-based violence is a reality and issue and an issue to be addressed since it has online and off offline consequences. Even it takes in many forms that Bangladesh police deal with, include cyber harassment using fake ID, defamation, threats by sending messages through social media, revenge porn and threats of rape sexual assault, hate speech, cyber stalking, image-based abuse, frequent online attack on women for not responding to a proposal made online or real life, blackmailing. Dear audience, more than 130 million Bangladeshi are now using mobile phone and thus this country stands 10th position in terms of mobile phone users of which 50 million users have access to the internet. However, this rapid expansion of technology comes with its downside. We see a sharp increase in technology facilitated gender-based violence. As a law enforcement agency, Bangladesh police take action against perpetrators who are committing online gender-based violence in Bangladesh. Cyber Department of DMP headquarters, Rapid Action Battalion, Cyber Police of CID, and superintendent police across the country are now continuously to prevent and respond to these cases. The National Telecommunication Monitoring Center, NTMC, under the Ministry of Home Affairs is now working to counter these issues. However, in a nutshell, the police department undertake the following action. Legal action is being taken against the criminals by collecting the information of the criminal along with continuing communication with, the, with mobile phone operators and ISP establishment in this regard, so that mobile and internet users cannot use information technology to commit crime. Action are being taken against criminals in the above mentioned matters by identifying fake ID, real IDs, which are related to their accused Facebook IDs. Legal action is being taken against criminal, including monitoring various pages on Facebook. Criminals are being dealt with according to the nature of their offenses. Criminals are arrested and handed over to the court. But coordination with other department or ministries to address online violence against women and girls is very important. And therefore, when we get information of online gender-based violence, we collect evidence and in need, we take help from cyber forensic. Online cases are filed against online criminals and sent to formal court immediately. We coordinate every, every aspect closely with NGOs and other government departments to address online gender-based violence. 
the Ministry of Women and Child Affairs provide witness support for online gender-based violence. There are six special cyber tribunal in Bangladesh to manage violence happened online gender-based violence and have special prosecutor to these tribunals. Cases of online gender-based violence are recorded under cyber crime offenses with increased use of digital platform women and girls are becoming more victim of online gender-based violence. Considering this issue, an online services called Police Cyber Support for Women was launched to protect them. Here, complaints are taken directly from women and girls. Women's victims are served there. All the members working in this team are also women as they feel more comfortable sharing their issues with them. With technical support from UNFPA, a dedicated help desk for women, children, elderly, and disabled have been set up in every police station all over the Bangladesh. And, and, and there is assigned a female officer there. There are police stations also address online gender-based violence there. Respective desk officers are trained on survival centered standard operating procedure to manage gender-based violence cases, including incident happening online. Cyberbullying is not only online, but offline issues also come to the online. The government has undertaken various initiatives to ensure cyber security of women and girls. For women, 109, and for children, 1098, these two help nice are available around the clock. People, police helpline 999 to respond to any emergency is also available there. Cyber Police Center, Bangladesh Police CID is available around the clock to prevent online gender-based violence and protect the survivors of online violence. Preventive measures are also taken by inter-ministerial meeting with law enforcement agencies on cyber issues. Despite this initiative, a lot of areas for further improvement and measures are needed by the police to stop online gender-based violence. To combat online gender-based violence, we use mainly Digital Security Act, Pornography Control Act, and Bangladesh Telecommunication Act to prevent online violence against women and girls. However, it is important of developing strong legal framework and ensure its proper implementation to prevent and combat all forms of violence, including in digital context, since online digital uh, online gender-based violence is increasing right now. So finally, I would like to recommend the law enforcement official need to be well trained on using modern technology to address technology facilitated online gender-based violence along with a clear code of conduct to offer cyber centric and trauma-informed response specialized unit such as police cyber support unit should be created with more women police officers will engage there so survivors can trust law enforcement agents bodies and report their consequences what happened for them it is very important to establish coordination mechanism among different government departments, especially with the Ministry of Women and Child Affairs, who are responsible to prevent and respond to gender-based violence. In addition, more collaboration is needed with media for promoting gender-sensitive reporting, private sector to improve accountability, and COCs to address violence against women on online. Multi-sectoral response is needed to address online gender-based violence comprehensively. This is from my side. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Mr. Tawhid, for your insights from the Bangladesh experience. Um, we, we picked up that you have highlighted some important areas related to having well-trained and trauma-informed 
uh, responders from the police, which is critical, and having a strong co coordination mechanism among different ministries with civil society, with NGOs. So thank you for bringing those perspectives to this uh, discussion today. Uh, I'm watching the time. I see that we need to move uh, into the next uh, discussant. So let me move uh, right away to Ms. Nigat Dad uh, from Pakistan and, um, and offer her uh, the question. Uh, we have um, uh, and a question for you related to uh, focusing on teaching users, especially women, to use technology safely as a way to use to prevent violence and avoid violence. Yet the problem is really growing with impacts online and offline. What more in your perspective is needed to prevent, intervene, and hold perpetrators accountable? And what actions should the private sector be taking? Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Melissa. Um, I'm actually really uh, pleased um, um, because speaking at this gathering ahead of 60, uh, 67th uh, CSW um, is really important for me because of the theme uh, of the CSW this year. Um, and as Commissioner already said uh, that in this increasingly digitized world, uh, issues such as the gender digital divide or uh, online gender-based violence are emerging as urgent issues uh, which need to be addressed to achieve the larger goal of gender equality. Um, and as someone who has been working with victims and survivors of online uh, and tech facilitated gender based violence for over a decade, I have seen firsthand the impact of uh, this form of violence in the offline space as well. Um, and I was just listening to our, um, our fellow uh, panelists from the law enforcement. Um, and I, as a lawyer myself, believe uh, uh, that you know, the importance of the having good law and law enforcement implementing these laws is a, a greater way to help victims and survivors dealing with uh, um, online gender based online gender based violence. However, uh, at other times, many women callers, uh, victims and survivors who actually reach out to our cyber harassment helpline uh, that we established in 2016 at Digital Rights Foundation, it reflected uh, in their experiences that uh, reaching out to law enforcement is not always the right answer for them. Uh, many do not want to go through the re-traumatizing process of filing a complaint, submitting evidences, intimate images uh, uh, in form of evidences or videos sometimes. And, and, and the way during court trial they face their perpetrators in person, face to face. Um, and also, uh, um, while working on these issues, in our experience, uh, it is also the case that uh, law enforcement agencies, no matter how uh, well intentioned they are, they are not all the time uh, uh, fully equipped to handle these cases properly. Either they lack resources or they lack gender sensitivity to uh, deal with such cases. Um, and given that this is an emerging form of violence, law enforcement agencies also often lack a nuanced understanding of online gender-based violence uh, to deal with it properly. Um, on the other hand, uh, I uh, uh, strongly believe that uh, we advocate for a survivor-centric approach to address uh, uh, tech-facilitated violence by looking beyond models of criminalization uh, and laws and to look towards a more holistic approach to address uh, tech facilitated violence by providing uh, maybe transformative support to the victims. We must ask actually survivors what they want, what they need. And when you ask this question, you will learn that solutions vary from survivors to survivor. And assuming solutions beforehand often really often does not help them heal from the tra trauma that they have experienced. And, um, and I also feel that uh, our solutions need to be designed in a way 
to ensure that we do not put the entire burden on survivors and victims to prevent the harassment against them, um, but rather look towards holding perpetrators accountable and put burden on the perpetrators. This accountability need not be pushing punishing someone, but often is the need for someone to take responsibility for the harm that was caused by them. Um, and talking about the uh, uh, perpetrators apart from women, how do we actually speak to men and family uh, as a whole to ensure that survivors are fully supported and especially coming from patriarchal conservative societies. Um, so I uh, actually know many civil society organizations working on the ground that are doing this important work. Uh, however, I also feel that uh, they are really supported uh, or given the required resources or funds to do this work in a sustainable way. It's mostly that we are doing one project and when the project ends, you know, the work doesn't go anywhere. And I, and I also feel that uh, we, uh, uh, that rather than just focusing on the regulatory or punitive approach, we recognize that laws can also be weaponized to target women and gender minorities and sexual minorities. Um, last year in October, I co-chaired a U UN Women Expert Group meeting in uh, again in relation to uh, the upcoming CSW, which put out a report in order to support the UN Secretary General's report that has just been released. And in our report, one of the theme was online and tech facilitated gender-based violence and discrimination. And some of the recommendations that came out of the consultations co consultation were the law, were, were that laws addressing uh, this form of violence need to be drafted, keeping in mind human rights uh, approach, international human rights framework, including freedom of expression and the right to privacy, equality and non-discrimination to the regulation of online spaces and develop universal guidelines on gendered uh, hate speech and disinformation. And, and keeping in mind that in global majority, where many a times, states are unwilling to invest resources into improving welfare programs and survivor support centers, we see criminalization is a quick fix rather than tackling the root of the problem. And um, I, I would like to end here and then uh, see where we can add further in the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nigat. I uh, really appreciate your uh, attention to the survivor-centered approach and understanding that if we are really starting with the survivors and letting the survivors guide us in terms of what they are interested in terms of accountability, what their perspective of justice is, uh, then, then we will be uh, on the right track uh, if, we are, if we are seeking to meet their needs. Um, we are conscious of the time. We need to move uh, rather quickly. So I'm gonna move into uh, the, the presentation and the uh, inputs from our colleague Dita Katarani. Um, and, and offer her the questions that we have prepared for her. Um, because of the interest of time, colleagues, we need to have enough time for the interventions from those that are here that have, that have signed up. We may need to skip the second question, so I'm going to ask you to bear with us as we, as we move through that. Um, so let me move to um, Ms. Katarani and ask you this question. Related to um, the a, sim a similar question that I've offered to to Ms. Ms. Dodd, there's so much focus on teaching users, especially women, to use technology safely as a way to avoid violence. Yet the problem is only growing with impacts online and offline. What more is needed to prevent, intervene, and hold perpetrators accountable? And what actors do you think the pri what what actions should the private sector be taking? Over to you, Dita. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa. And also thank you so much for the other panelists. You really, um, what, you are, what you are presenting really resonate with the, the, the context in Indonesia as well. Um, so what, what I'm going to say, it's actually not much different from what Nika has said and also other panelists. So I'm just gonna add a um, um, few things. Um, so I just wanna make it clear that there is nothing wrong with teaching women to use um, technology safely. But we need to also understand that using technology safely is not just for women, it's for everyone. And we also have to be very careful because what we 
often see on the ground, teaching um, women how to use technology safely, a lot of time means get, keeping women from expressing themselves, from having their opinion heard on, on you know, on uh, the digital spaces. So we have to be very careful about that. So um, as Nigat said that we need a holistic approach, holistic actions in um, you know, combating or addressing online gender-based violence. One of the things that we need, of course, a good law, right? And I know that in the uh, region, there are already good laws in, um, um, you know, implemented that will address online that, that me that was meant to address this um, online gender-based um, violence. But like, as you say in the questions, but we see the cases are rising. It is because that laws, uh, what we need, that what we see now, laws tend to be punitive, but not transformative. We need laws that is transformative. transformative. It should provide guidelines that can encourage political, social and cultural change in all levels, in the state levels, in law enforcement levels, even in the society levels, that could ensure the accountability of everyone who participate in digital spaces. That is what we are lacking. We also need law that centers around the needs of the victims or survivors. Access to justice should be given to victims or survivors. And I would like, from my experience, also assisting our experience, assisting, assisting um, victims and also survivors of uh, online gender-based violence, justice can mean different things. From what, from our experience, only half, less than half, less than half of victims actually want the perpetrators to be punished. They want that they can, you know, like for example, they want that the violence stop. The, if the violence in the form of, you know, um, NCII or non-consensual distributions of intimate images, they want those images to be taken down. They want uh, support, psychological support, social support from the people around them, from the states and also from the society when they experience this OGBV. So I think this law needs to give options to victims, to survivors on what kind of um, um, solution that or mitigation that they need, not only just to punish the perpetrators, but also, of course, the law also should enable if there is victims or survivor wants uh, the uh, perpetrators to be punished. So this is, you know, the laws that really ensure the access to justice with options for victims and survivors to get the justice that they want. It's very important. So um, on the questions on the private sectors, I think what is important, number one, is that the, the um, private sectors needs to start recognizing that OGBP is actually real. Because like for now, a lot of private sectors, you know, those who own the platform, just treat OGBVs as any other misbehavior online. Yeah. So when they receive on these cases, you know, reports on cases of OGBV, they will also treat it as other kind of reports. I think it's very important. And a lot of time, a lot of time actually we have um of difficulties when we report these cases of online gender-based violence, and they say that this is not online gender-based violence. This is a um, um, freedom of expression for other people. So I think this, the private sectors need to understand this and recognize that um, um, OGBV, and then develop a mechanism, a specific mechanism for handling or addressing cases of OGBV in their platform because of the cap specific or special characteristic of this OGBV compared to other online misbehavior. Um, also, I would like in this um, opportunity, I would like to also recommend um, a regional coordinate coordinations between countries, between states in the regions, because the, the nature of technology on how uh, perpetrators and victims could be from different countries. And a lot of time, this gives us difficulties in addressing the case. So, uh, 
you know, regional, between states, between organizations in, you know, all countries in the region, if we have a coordination, maybe um, it would be better for us uh, to make our to 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 make our work work in addressing online gender based violence would be become better and also easier. I think that is for now for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dita Katarani, for your insights. Uh, and you've really highlighted the importance of designing legislation, regulatory frameworks that are designed around the wishes of survivors, recognizing that not all survivors are simply after a form of punishment. They might want something different. Uh, so we need to be a bit creative and, and to have those conversations with survivors in order to make sure our laws are, and laws and policies are, are doing what they need to be doing to be accountable to those survivors. So thank you for that. Um, so we are going to now move into the uh, it's next part of the session. Uh, I want to thank all of you who have just presented during the panel for your insights, your evidence, your practice-based knowledge and learning drawn directly from working with survivors, pro providing that direct support many of you have done um, and who have you know, expressed, expressed your uh, key strategies for dedicating to uh, providing protection, accountability, and support to those affected by this issue. I invite you to join me in giving a round of applause to the panelists. Thank you so much, all of you. Uh, and I'm now pleased to hand the floor over to the co-moderator of the session, Galani Duressa from UNFPA. Thank you, Melissa. Following our panel discussion, we will now begin the plenary discussions, which will run for the next 35 minutes. May I please remind our participants that the outcome of this consultation will be a set of recommendations on areas for accelerated action in line with the priority theme for CSW 67. The set of recommendations will be informed by the four substantive sessions, including this session. In the plenary discussions, government representatives are invited to share their experiences and practices. This will be followed by perspectives from other stakeholders. As we would like to hear from as many stakeholders as possible, we ask that all interventions please be kept to no more than two minutes. We have a timer to assist us with the timekeeping. In the guidance note for participants that was circulated in advance of this meeting, we invited expressions of interest to intervene. Those who have submitted expressions in advance will be given the floor first. For those joining online, you may also request the floor using the chat box listing the request to speak together with your full name and country organization. Raising your hand in Zoom will not register your request to speak. Those joining in person may raise the placard or their hands to request the floor. Please note that we will only accept one intervention per country under each agenda item and that interventions will be invited by government representatives first. Other stakeholders who have not intervened under other sessions will be prioritized above those who have previously had the opportunity to speak. As we are limited on time, we may not be able to call on all participants who wish to speak during this session. Please remember, you may request the floor in the following session on the recommendations. I now open the floor for government representatives. I invite Christine Rosari Yuzon Chavez, Executive Director, Philippines Commission on Women, the Philippines, to take the floor. Excellencies, colleagues, good afternoon. The Philippines strongly condemns all forms of gender-based violence or GBV, particularly during crises like the COVID-19 pandemic. In response to the prevalence of online and technology facilitated GBV and discrimination, the Philippines successfully passed two landmark laws and is in the process of strengthening its comprehensive law enforcing anti-violence against women or the anti vow law. The groundbreaking Safe Spaces Act was enacted in 2019. The law aims to address the many forms and spaces in which gender-based sexual harassment takes place. It expressly defines gender-based sexual harassment in public spaces, including in streets, malls, restaurants, government offices, evacuation centers, public transportation and terminals, and in private vehicles operated by app-based services such as Grab. 
The Safe Spaces Act also penalizes gender-based online sexual harassment, which uses ICT to terrorize or intimidate victims, including in the workplace, schools, educational or training institutions. The anti-online sexual abuse or exploitation of children and the anti-child sexual abuse or Exploitation Materials Act was passed in July 2022. It ensures the right of children to useful, meaningful, and safe access to digital technologies while protecting them from any form of violence online. It seeks to protect children from, the, from an exhausted, exhaustive list of sexual acts through online or offline means or a combination of both, including the inducement or co coercion of a child to engage or be involved in child sexual abuse or exploitation materials through whatever means. Finally, almost 20 years after the Anti-Violence Against Women and Their Children Act was passed, we aim to examine its impact and effectivity in, in addressing current trends and emerging forms of vow, including in the context of digitalization, emergencies, crisis, and other challenges. With these laws in place, we hope to create safe spaces for women and girls online. Thank you very much. Thank you, Delegate from the Philippines. May I now invite Maria Filomena Babo Martins, National Director of Gender and Gender Policy and Inclusion, Timor Leste, to take the floor. Thank you, Moderator. Good afternoon to all of us here. In Timor Leste, we have law against domestic violence since 2010. According to the Article 13, is given a mandate to the government through the Secretary of State for Equality and Inclusion to establish a national action plan against gender-based violence with four pillars engaging uh, all relevant ministries, such as Minister of so Social Solidarity, Minister of Interior through PNTL, National Police of Timor-Leste, Minister of Health, Minister of U uh, Education, Minister of Justice, to prevent gender-based uh, violence and then to combat violence against women and girls. So we have the three steps, first steps from 2012 to 2015, second from 2017 to 2021, and then the last one, the new one is from 2022 to 2032, the duration is 10 years. We do have international commission with uh, 22 line ministries and three CSO to monitor the implementation of the national action plan on gender-based violence. We uh, socialize it through the um, television, through um, socialization, through 16 days campaign, through uh, trainings, seminars, etc. We do, we also, we have um, a resolution on sexual harassment to prevent um, sexual harassment uh, in public administration. And we have also a template called Chatbot Rosa to, to, for victims or uh, survivors to report the cases. Together with UN Women, we have signed an agreement on a spotlight initiative since 2021 to implement in the three municipalities targeting women, girls, and intimate partners. We also have a re-entry policy to, have, to help girls, students drop out from schools because of accidentally get pregnant. So they, they have uh, still have opportunity to to get the certificate once, uh, even though they are pregnant. Um, we, uh, they, uh, around the country, we, we ha have um, 11 uh, shelters to, to assist the, the victims and also the survivors of um, violence against women and girls in Timor-Leste. Um, now I'm going to also to talk about um, recommendation uh, for the first and uh, second 
uh, session since yesterday, we do recommend to connect to unconnect to improve the connectivity to also um, introduce uh, the STEAM program to early age uh, school and then safe space online to protect women and girls and then regulation policy and law for cyber crime. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate from Timor-Leste. May I now invite Salwana Mahmoud, Principal Assistant Secretary, Policy and Strat Strategic Planning Division, Malaysia, to take the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. Uh, Malaysia continues to contest any forms of gender-based violence and discrimination in protecting the rights of women and girls either online or offline. This is critical in achieving gender equality and improving the overall well-being of women and girls. Special attention is given to promote policies and programs that combat violence against women and girls while providing services to support survivors. Malaysia reform regulatory policies and legislation to mobilize action in improving efficiency, responsiveness, and effectiveness to protect the rights of women and girls. Domestic Violence Act 1994 provides legal protections in situations of domestic violence that includes protection orders, compensation, and access to rehabilitation programs. In addition, a committee of addressing domestic violence was established as an institutionalized multi-stakeholder platform for implementing and monitoring concerted efforts to address domestic violence. 2022 was also a groundbreaking year as the parliament passed the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act to provide sexual harassment survivors an alternative to seek compensation or damages from perpetrator by making a complaint to the Tribunal of Anti-Sexual Harassment. It is government's effort to ensure that sexual harassment is not normalized in the country by creating awareness for the public. Education and awareness programs are much needed to challenge the social norms and stereotypes that contribute to violence against women. Policies and programs implemented are gender sensitive, includes positive representation of women in media and advertising, and that girls are encouraged to pursue their passions and interests regardless of societal expectations. Leveraging on gender responsiveness, cyber safety policies, and digital rights, we call to uphold confidentiality and protection of information assets. The Malaysian government's approach to cybersecurity is primarily based on national cybersecurity policies to strengthen the level of information security and data protection. Through this initiative, we can empower women and girls to reach their full potential and contribute to a more prosperous and equitable society for all. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate from Malaysia. I would like to now invite Mohammed Faisal from Pakistan, who I believe making an online statement to take the floor. Uh, Mr. Mohammed Faisal, are you online? If not, I think we will move on. Uh, well, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the time for this session. <laughs> I'm really happy for to see this. And I'm from Pakistan, and uh, I'm the director of Ministry of Human Rights. And we are working on a, a, a seven convention, and also it is related to the CEDA. And uh, I'm already been uh, published almost 120 articles and uh, two books already been. And uh, my PhD is related to artificial intelligence. So uh, now the work and the theme of the scenario is to be related for the uh, for the for the digitizing of the data, uh, and also it is uh, related to the women uh, issues and women violations issues. And uh, as before uh, before my uh, speaker has to be defined for for the countryside and i'm i'm uh, throwing uh, the information regarding pakistan and pakistan trying to uh, convince uh, the related issues related to women uh, uh, women issues and uh, related to children abuse issues uh, also be defined in the form of a digitized uh, data thing and uh, this is the data set has to be uh, trying to convince uh, internationally recognized uh, by the help of UN uh, treaty bodies. And um, 
just I I just uh, 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 opening this session the, this remarks for this side and trying that uh, to convey uh, the convention issues uh, just like in our country uh, you know, related to women violation issues has to be defined regularly and uh, we are trying that uh, solve the issues by the help of digitizing data and uh, we are uh, uh, using some uh, HRIMS portal just like human rights information related portals and define it in the in the worldwide session the, to show that the Pakistan is a very peaceful country and regards uh, the helping for the women and children also for this session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. delegate from Pakistan. As we've received no further requests from the floor from government representatives, I now open the floor for non-government participants as well as representatives from UN entities. I invite Carla Kovarubias, Human Rights Officer, OHCHR, Regional Office for Southeast Asia, to take the floor. Thank you very much. Excellencies, distinguished guests, participants, Digital technology and connectivity offer the world and has offered the world unprecedented opportunities and is an enabler for gender equality and women's equal enjoyment of human rights. And this has delivered tremendous tools, as we've heard, for women and girls worldwide, as well as here in Asia. The digital era has generated wider and a lot more opportunities for women human rights defenders, politicians and journalists, media workers to both work, educate, learn, connect, mobilize, drive social change, and participate in public and democratic life. A number of the UN human rights mechanisms, including the UN Human Rights Council special procedures and the UN, uh, UN human rights treaty body monitoring bodies have elaborated on the implication of gender equality and women's human rights in relation to all of these issues. And they have issued a lot of recommendations on how to protect and promote human rights, including gender equality in the use of digital technologies. We will not be able to cover all of these recommendations, but we wanted to highlight three. One, everyone, has the right to express themselves freely and without fear and risks, both online and offline. Freedom of expression, these are preconditions for both empowering women and girls to challenge stereotypes, patterns of discrimination, and for effective change. Two, states need to expand the open and inclusive online civic space in particular for human, women human rights defenders, while protecting safety and security of users of that space. And three, women and girls must be fully part of these discussions and in the driving seat in shaping the measures we need to be taking. We thank you very much for inviting OHCHR to this regional consultation. Thank you. I note that the delegate from Sri Lanka would like to take the floor. I invite you to take the floor. Thank you very much, dear moderator and dear colleagues. An increasing rate of uh, internet penetration with the promise of uh, universal access, a high rate of mobile phone usage and its integration in the daily lives of people the popularity of social media platforms and availability of local languages for online communication enable women and adolescent girls uh, to take advantage of uh, correct developments in technology for empowering themselves. However, for those who are not aware of the pitfalls of digital spaces, using the internet and its resources has been a harrowing experience. The National Committee on Women under the Ministry of women conducted research on cyber technology and women harassment a few years back. The research was uh, done based on the complaint received from the toll free women's helpline 1938. The research report recommended to reduce disparities in legal, social and technological spheres. The Computer Crimes Act number 24 uh, 2007 
is the main law related to cyber crimes, but it is deal dealing primarily with computer related crimes. However, legislation is uh, in this area needs to be evaluated regularly. Amendments and new law and reforms have to be done. To address this gap, uh, cyber security bill was drafted having the objective uh, of effective implementation of uh, national cyber security strategy in Sri Lanka, but yet uh, it is not passed by, uh, it is not in, uh, uh, it is not in force yet. The toll-free 24-hour uh, operating uh, women helpline 1938 and child helpline uh, 1929 is uh, in operation for the cyber violence as well. Moreover, counseling officers and women development officers all over the island help uh, to give counseling and uh, necessary psychosocial support for the victims. To ensure effective law enforcement system, training and awareness raising programs are conducted for judges police officers and officers of women and child units in police stations to sensitize them towards handling of women and girl complaints. Uh, Ministry of Women work with CSOs and NGOs who work in this area. Ministry officials were trained in cyber violence violations with the support of such organizations. While ensuring legal safeguard for victims who have identified uh, we have identified prevention is better than cure, so that uh, it was identified that educational institutions such as schools, vocational training institutions, universities should include a component in their curriculum on safety on the internet, privacy and avoiding risky behaviors uh, for new entrants, uh, both girls and boys. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate from Sri Lanka. Are there any other governments who would like to take the floor? Cambodia. I invite the Delegate from Cambodia to take the floor. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, just briefly about uh, Cambodia um, achievement for the combating violence against women. Uh, actually, we have the um, a national uh, policy uh, uh, on the action plan to prevent uh, violence against women, which is involved 17 ministry, uh, four development partner, and 30 NGO and SO and private sector. Uh, until now, the, we support for the policy, and then we establish um, the mechanism from both uh, la at national level and subnational level, which is uh, involved for the many stakeholders and we create one-stop services um, to provide a uh, service to the victim who come to uh, receive our service very easy than before and now we are pilot in uh, four provinces and we plan to expand more into other provinces and more important is Cambodia National Council we have the uh, legal aid provider uh, which is uh, collaborate with the Bar Association of Cambodia. We provide fee with the lawyer to the victim who come, uh, who did the, the lawyer services. That both of the uh, channel and can have more female who suffering from the uh, violence. It's not in the family, but other form that we receive and then we defend for uh, many cases and we, we win uh, many cases in the court. So other agency will be um, uh, collaborate with the Ministry of Telecom to check, uh, you know, online and block some other website who are not, you know, necessary or uh, have some uh, negative side of the violence against women. And I have one of the recommendation that um, uh, addressing online harassment and violence against women is still very important and we need to strengthen, coordinate, and so we respond to enhancing prevention and through the network. And we currently, we will have the, the network to uh, prepare that uh, framework. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate from Cambodia. Are there, I would like to invite Indonesia to take the floor. Thank you, moderator. 
Allow me to first of all introduce ourselves, the National Commission on Violence Against Women or Komnas Perempuan, which is an independent body and work as a national human rights institution with a specific mandate to pursue conducive environment to eliminate all forms of violence against women and to promote women's human rights. In our unique position as independent state institution, hence our submission today does not represent the Indonesian government's view, but an exercise of our independent authority as a monitoring body. Distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, in the year of 2022, Komnas Perempuan received more than 3,500 reports of cases violence against women. Among those, around 45% or almost 1,600 reported cases are perpetrated online. Almost half of the cases are perpetrated by ex-intimate partners or husbands and mostly are sexual violence. We are also alert that women human rights defenders and female journalists are facing particular risk of online gender-based intimidation and violence in relation to their works. In response to the spiking number of online violence, Indonesia new law on sexual crime issued in May 2022 regulated specifically online sexual violence. Perpetrators can be sanctioned up to six years imprisonment or a fine of up to 20,000 US dollar. The victims are eligible to access assistance from the very beginning of the reports, including legal aid, mental health service, and other needed physical support. Besides preserve immunity from any legal sanction, also, the victims have the rights to be forgotten. In relation to this, Komnas Perempuan would like to request the CSW Forum to review and strengthen the implementation of the rights to be forgotten since women are disproportionately bear the burden of stigma related to the unwanted publication of sexual content. Whilst increased legal protection and the implementation are pivotal, Komnas Perempuan appreciate and share the views of both government and CSO on the urgency to accelerate and continuously improve digital literacy education program that integrates the enhancement of measures to transform gender-based power, uh, power relation in balance and on the rights to bodily integrity in order to effectively prevent, participate, and mitigate the respective problems. Komnas Perempuan recommend the CSW Forum to pursue the adoption of pedagogies suitable for the age of targeted audience in the development of the digital literacy programs with special attention to the law enforcers, service providers for women victims of violence, and those with specific barriers in accessing digital infrastructures, including elderly, disability, non-binary uh, gender groups, and other marginalized groups in the society. Thank you. Thank you. And we note that you represent uh, an independent commission and not the government of Indonesia. Are there any other governments that would like to take the floor? If not, uh, seeing none, uh, Bangladesh, uh, I invite you to take the floor. Thank you, Madam Director. Just uh, to the and the fines. I want to mention one point initiated by the government of Bangladesh uh, to prevent gender-based violence. So our Ministry of Women and Children Affairs and the government of Bangladesh launched CCTV in public transport that helps to uh, prevent uh, gender-based violence and also the women's safety in moving here and there. And it gets the mobility of women in safe way. And it was a strong mechanism system and controlling control and we always uh, monitor everything and it helps the women and the girls who are easily move here and there by using their public transport and it helps uh, uh, to the law enforcing agency to take the evidence and if someone had the culprit or some other people they could take in action against him or her so this helps uh, yeah, and also get a great opportunity uh, to women mobility. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate from Bangladesh. Are there any other governments that would like to take the floor? Seeing none, then I would like, I would like to invite Kalpana Rai, Advocacy and Com Campaign Officer from Beyond the Beijing Committee, Nepal. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Kalpana from Beyond Beijing Committee in Nepal, and uh, it is my privilege to share recommendations from the Asia Pacific Civil Society Forum. 
big tech companies eschew transparency and accountability in favor of privatization and protection of trade secrets, which include algorithms that amplify hate speech along with gender-based violence. It is influencing the public's perceptions of sexual and reproductive health and rights, bodily autonomy and integrity, and gender-based violence. Along with the lack of digital literacy and digital divide, it results in victimization and stigmatization that adds another layer of abuse and trauma on survivors of online gender-based violence. Women human rights defenders, LGBTIQ+, and non-binary people, and other marginalized groups are at particular risk of targeted misogynistic hate speech campaigns. Content deemed sexual is subjectively moderated with censorship of women and LGBTIQ plus groups. It, at the same time, tech platforms are making profit through online sex work. With this, we urge member states to move away from overregulation and criminalization and criminalization of offenses that may only require civil remedies like defamation, which is often used as a weapon to silence victims and survivors of gender-based violence. Ensure rights, participation, security, and well-being of women, girls, and LGBTIQ persons in online spaces. Build safe spaces for marginalized groups to exchange and access information and tools. Ensure that law and policy that addresses gender-based violence include online GVV instead of a specific policy for online space and reassure that policy is developed through inclusive and participatory process. We urge governments to increase efforts to raise awareness and educate women and girls at LGBTIQ+, and the general public on the right to SRHR and bodily autonomy, and ensure full and comprehensive integration of comprehensive sexuality education in, in school curriculum in accordance to the needs of girls and young people in all the diversity in and out of school. Ensure availability, affordability, and accessibility of digital tools and technology at all levels inclusively and ev evenly, leaving no one behind. Lastly, we urge the governments to ensure financing for effective and accelerated implementation of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action and the gender responsive implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development toward achieving the empowerment of all women and girls in all the diversity, gender equality, and development justice in the context of innovation and technological change and education in the digital age. Thank you so much. Thank you. I would now like to invite Hija Kamran, Association of Progressive Communications Pakistan, to take the floor. Um, thank you, moderator, and uh, thank you, speakers, for your valuable contribution. My name is Hija Kamran. I'm from Pakistan and representing a global organization, Association for Progressive Communications. Despite the many opportunities that the internet offers, deep-rooted patriarchy and harmful gender stereotypes perpetuated within and outside of the internet, have contributed to the rise of gender-based violence against women and gender-diverse folks in online public spaces. The internet is used to exclude, discriminate, uh, discriminate against, and abuse women, including journalists and human rights defenders, young girls, gender-diverse communities like LGBTQIA and non-binary persons. Across Asia and the Pacific, gender disinformation, targeted and coordinated hate speech campaigns, online sexual abuse, including intimate partner violence, and other forms of gender-based violence perpetuate misogyny and patriarchal notions, and it does not help that legal remedies are not effective to protect them. This forces them to self-censor or even leave online spaces in hopes for the abuse to stop, leading to widening of gender digital divide. At this point, as we move, move to discuss the status of women in, in an increasingly digitized world, we must acknowledge that online spaces are a reflection of offline spaces, that online and offline violence happen in a continuum, that the dichotomy between the two is a myth, and that online violence either stems from or leads to offline violence. And so the implications of online violence are similar to that of offline, including devastating long-term psychological, personal, and professional impacts. With this, uh, we as Civil Society Forum urge member states to proactively include women and gender diverse communities on policy-making tables, and to take measures to ensure safety of these communities in online spaces by introducing appropriate and gender sensitive legislation that do not infringe on civil liberties of individuals. We also encourage your member states to um, reform language by the way of which online gender based violence is, re is regarded in regulatory spaces with priority given to eliminate power dynamics and inequalities 
that make online spaces in, inaccessible and unsafe for women and gender diverse groups and focus on their rights and autonomy with an understanding that they're not voiceless, rather structurally, structurally silenced. We also urge member states to allocate budget to support gender inclusive and trauma responsive, responsive services for victims and survivors of online gender based violence. Thank you. Thank you. I would now like to invite Giska Ayu Pratiwi, Program Officer, Women Health Foundation, Indonesia, to take the floor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, distinguished participants. I'm Giska Ayu from Women Health Foundation, Indonesia, and it is a privilege also to, for me to share a recommendation from the Asia Pacific Civil Society Forum. Gender-based violence that happens to women and girls cannot be separated from sexual and reproductive health and rights, or SRHR, which must be fulfilled comprehensively through education, information, and services. The understanding of SRHR can reduce the number of gender-based violence, both online or offline, and it can be fulfilled by the Comprehensive Sexual Education, or CSE. The technology and digital media have facilitated the delivery of health information and services through the use of oh, telemedicine. Okay. In terms of use of technology for providing safe abortion information and services, strengthening access to medical abortion with pills and telemedicine have a huge potential in strengthening access and confidentiality, confi confidentiality for women seeking safe abortion. However, this is not applicable to those who are challenged by digital divide in accessing the care they have the rights to. As sexual and reproductive health is still seen as sensitive and taboo, the censorship of content related to SRHR remains pervasive and prevents women, girls, and young people from accessing SRHR information and services. The safety and security in the use of technology is a concern too. With this, we urge member states to, first, ensure comprehensive sexual education will be transformed to a digital learning curriculum in line with international technical guidance on sexual education and that is accessible to all women and girls in and out of school settings. Second, apply right-based approach to the provision of SRHR services in the digital age. Young women and girls must have access to the full spectrum of information and reproductive health care services that include contraception, CSE, maternity care, post-abortion care, and safe abortion. This includes ensuring access to medical abortion is rights-based, ensuring pregnant persons have access to adequate information and services in an informed manner without stigma and discrimination. Third, avoid policies or law that could harm women and girls, as well as the victims of sexual violence and act as barriers to access information and services of sexual and reproductive health. And the last, develop regulations and safeguards regarding learning technologies so that education and online services remain a public good accessible to all people with safe and secure use of digital technology and protection of their privacy. Thank you. Thank you. I would now like to invite Isabel Kingsley, Research Associate, University of New South Wales, to take the floor. Thank you, moderator. Uh, my name is Isabel Kingsley. I'm from the Australian government's Women in STEM Ambassador Initiative. I want to make one main recommendation uh, that relates not only to this session, but all the sessions that we've had over the last two days. And that is the need um, to continuously monitor and evaluate the impact and the success of our initiatives um, so that we can know what works and what doesn't work to reduce um, online gender violence what works to empower girls and women in education and careers and to improve gender equity and equality in general. So many of the delegates have touched on this point, but I want to strongly emphasize the importance of collecting and reporting data as evidence of if and to what extent our initiatives are creating the change we want to achieve. Understanding what works will inform our initiatives that um, of like, what we put our valuable time and money and energy into. It'll inform what initiative should be scaled up and what we should stop doing or discontinue. And ultimately it'll inform our discussions next year at CSW 68 and into the future. So monitoring and evaluation will hold us accountable and help us make the best um, decisions and actions towards uh, achieving gender equality. Thank you. 
Thank you. I'd now like to see if there are any non-government participants in the room who would like to take the floor. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Shabana al Kasir from the Philippines. With the added layer of mobility restrictions during, during the pandemic, the internet quickly became the most accessible public space. Incidents of online sexual harassment increased as harassment that would normally occur on site then became harassments and threats of harm online. It is alarming how misogynistic and non-consensual content are easily uploaded and shared massively in social media platforms. As an individual, it is so taxing to have to report each and every misogynistic post to be able to take them down. And as CSOs, we cannot do this incrementally and on our own. On this note, we, re we reiterate the need to ensure that digital companies are responsible for proactively addressing threats and harms happening in their platforms. Cybersecurity is a relatively new concept. Hence, cyber crimes are still not fully defined in our national laws and international documents. We hope that in the upcoming 67th CSW, legal universal definitions, guidelines, and mechanisms will be pushed forward. Care must be our government's main responsibility, especially during times of crisis. But we, ha we cannot subsist on care alone. The government needs to provide a baseline level of quality care for everybody, including GBV response and SRH support services that are rights-based, survivor-centric, gender-transformative, trauma-informed, and widely available, especially in this digital age. This is an essential and crucial move to ensure the fulfillment of our sexual and reproductive health and rights. We come together to remind ourselves that gender-based violence, even when it is not physical, even when it is committed, it is not committed in person, even when it's committed through remarks online, has no place in our society. Leaders and people in power who continue to normalize and even weaponize this online violence through the spread of gender disinformation and populist attacks must be held accountable. We hope to see more policymakers, government institutions, organizations, advocates, purposefully and intentionally working towards ensuring that our digital spaces are safe and just spaces for women, girls, and gender diverse persons to enter and thrive at. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to invite the participant raising your hand. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chair and Moderator. I'm Kavita Bahing, representing Body and Data Nepal and Research. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share my recommendations from South Asia, South Asia and a society, Civil Society Forum. Acknowledging the digital space has provided for people to explore and express their self and sexuality. However, it is it allowed it a form of so communal spaces exercise their rights to assembly and association and beyond. We cannot overlook the existence of online targeted gender-based violence, hate speech towards women, girls, LGBTIQA plus individuals, Dalit communities. The violence is being perpetrated by the state on marginalized group through formulating and implementation of restrictive and criminalized laws by implementing invasive technology that can be harmful by not taking into consideration of their rights to privacy. The non-state actors, including big tech companies, and restrict are restricting freedom of expressions by censoring content through their community guidelines, algorithms, and content moderations that are based on patriarchal cishet to dominant nor narrative of morality and protectionist ideas. The business models through mass extractions and manipulations of data are influenced, are influencing policies and politics, which is impacting democratic process in countries all over the world, with direct impact on the marginalized groups. The social media companies are not taking responsibility on countering violence against gender minorities, racial, religious, and ethnic minorities against Dalit communities in their platforms. Therefore, we want to draw attention of government, UN, and member states to look at the nuances of laws, policies, and practices that are directly and indirectly perpetuating online violence based on online violence and acknowledge that the online gender-based violence is an outcome of unequal power relationship based on gender, caste, 
class disability, inequality, age, occupations, and beyond, and that only laws are not going to be solve them, going to solve them. Therefore, we strongly recommend for review laws that are criminalizes that there are criminalizes expressions based on patriarchal notions of obscenity, national security, and morality, which are creating violence against marginalized groups and amend ambiguous and blanket laws and policies that ignores the intersectional realities of people. We recommend include state and tech companies, in, tech company enabling violence, online gender-based violence as one of the violence impacting women, queer individuals, and other marginalized groups to thrive online. We recommend states for proper threat assessment before implementing any technology and its impact on people and protect their citizens from all kinds of potential harms and violence and empower to respond them. We recommend to make big tech, we recommend to we recommend making big tech companies accountable for harms that they are causing by influencing democratic process for this this for disregarding rights to privacy by not respecting consent of its users and for not taking actions against the violence towards marginalized group on their platforms and national and international actors to take that initiative. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. I would now like to see if Jivika Shiv, member of Feminist Munch, is online. Okay, if not, we'll move to a close. With many thanks and much appreciation for all the interventions, we have heard that new technologies have greatly expanded the scale, speed, and reach of content shared online, which can exacerbate pre-existing forms of intersectional gender-based violence. There is a strong call for the adoption of a comprehensive definition of online and technology-facilitated gender-based violence, which often manifests offline as well as online, and the integration of this issue within existing GBV legislations and policies. Recognizing the importance of a survivor-centered approach to creating and implementing policy to address technology-facilitated gender-based violence, we heard recommendations on creating inclusive and rights-based multi-sectoral coordination systems and set up complaints mechanisms that safeguard bodily autonomy, anonymity, and confidentiality of women and girls. Digital technology companies, including internet service providers, have an important role to play and need to fulfill their responsibilities to respect the rights of women and girls on their platforms, implement standards, establish and enforce strict codes of conduct, and implement transparent and accessible reporting and remedy mechanisms. There are just, these are just a few of the ideas raised by speakers during this session. Please note that the summary recommendations from each of the four substantive sessions will be presented by session co-leads from the UN system during the fifth session on review of recommendations and closing of consultations, which will take place at 2.30 p.m. today. During this session, comments on the draft recommendations will be welcomed. The meeting report, including the recommendations, will be shared with all participants in due time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alvarado and Ms. Teresa for your moderation and to all of our panelists and participants for your valuable inputs. We will now take a lunch break before returning for our last session at 2.30. Excellencies, distinguished guests and participants, welcome back. We will now begin our last session, review of recommendations and closing of consultations. In this session, our colleagues will present and review the summary recommendations by session. The floor will be open to representatives for contributions to these recommendations in the following session. I will now hand the floor to our moderators, Ms. Chai Chai, Officer in Charge, Social Development Division of SCAP, and Ms. Sarah Nibbs, Regional Director at Interim, UN Women Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Ms. Chai Chai, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Distinguished representatives, civil society partners, colleagues, it is our great pleasure to welcome you back to the regional consultation 
and join the fifth and the final session in which we will review the recommendations uh, from each session uh, of our consultation. First of all, of all, thank you to all participants, panelists, and moderators for engaging in this insightful discussions on both the current status as well as the best ways forward. From the first day's discussion, we now have a clear uh, understanding of the persistent gender digital divide and the gendered impacts of digital transformation, as well as the barriers impeding women and girls to embark on STEM related studies or careers. Today's sessions made clear the importance to provide more robust and gender inclusive policies for women and girls and to integrate a gendered lens into technological innovation as well as the pressing need to eliminate online gender-based violence and discrimination. I was heartened to hear of the promising practices and examples of progressive policies shared. We need more of this to advance gender equality in the digital age, and we need them now. I'm therefore very much looking forward to this session as we will review the recommendations uh, by each session and hear your overall reflections and insights in the plenary discussion that we will follow. The recommendations will feed into the CSW 67's uh, discussions and can inform membership contribution to the agreed conclusions. They will support us in creating a more equal, inclusive and secure digital sphere for women and girls in Asia and the Pacific in order to ensure no one is left behind in the digital age. Please note that the recommendations will form part of the meeting report, and we will circulate a draft report to you for your review and feedback after the conclusion of this meeting. I will now hand over uh, to my colleague, uh, Ms. Sarah Nibs, who will invite co-leads of each session from the UN system to present the key recommendations. Sarah, over to you. Thank you so much, Chai Chai. So just to outline how the next part of the session will look, uh, we will begin with a review of the recommendations by session. Each of our session co-leads will have no more than seven minutes to present the recommendations, and there are going to be four substantive, uh, set, four substantive sessions reflecting the sessions that you, that you had earlier. We will then move on to the plenary contributions to the recommendations where government representatives and other stakeholders will be invited to share their perspectives and experiences. I'd like to remind you that as this is not a formal intergovernmental meeting, the recommendations will be decided on by general consensus and there won't be a formal adoption process. So we ask that in your feedback, you please focus on the main ideas presented instead of focusing on specific language or grammar for editing. So with no further ado, I would like to invite our first co-lead, Ms. Ko Miao, who is the Asia-Pacific Gender Advisor and Gender Team Leader from UNDP Asia-Pacific Regional Bureau to present the recommendations from Session 1 on ensuring meaningful connectivity to close the gender digital divide and promoting gender transformative te technology design, development and deployment. Ms. Miao, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, uh, and good afternoon. Everyone, from the session one, we have three sets of recommendations. The first one starts with a, a, a large heading, strengthen multilateral cooperation, including at regional and sub-regional levels in the development of inclusive digital technologies to advance universally sustainable, meaningful, enriching, productive, and empowering online experiences for women and girls. One, ensure and monitor the inclusion of gender responsive budgeting in the development of new technologies in line with the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. Two, promote gender analysis as an integral part of technological investment, research, and design. Three, guarantee that new technologies are developed within the regulatory framework that promote and respect women's rights according to the 2030 Agenda. Four, 
enhance the role of multilateral cooperation to accelerate progress towards the SDGs, especially SDG 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 17. Five, improve availability to granular data to monitor the access to and utilization of digital technologies amongst girls and women in all their diversities. Six, recommend appropriate measures by private sector companies and raise awareness among policymakers concerning cyberbullying, cybercrime, as well as the societal cost of inappropriate online behavior, including sexist hate speech. The second set, B, enhance meaningful connectivity that is safe, accessible, and affordable for all. Seven, develop and or update adequate data protection regulations and laws to ensure that access to digital technologies is safe and secure for women and girls. Eight, promote and secure accessible prices for devices and services by reducing consumer taxes on them and if needed, provide targeted subsidies or support to girls and women, especially those from marginalized communities to access digital services and devices. Nine, encourage the sharing of digital infrastructure to reduce costs for operators. 10, encourage public-private partnerships between government and companies to speed up the delivery of accessible and reliable connectivity. 11, improve the digital infrastructure for women and girls in remote or rural areas by developing targeted interventions to enable electricity, connectivity, high-speed internet, and mobile broadband networks. 12, promote a multi-sector whole of government approach, including smart villages and smart islands, as well as smart city initiatives to deliver connectivity while leveraging multifunctionality and reuse of ICT infrastructure. The approach should be holistic and inclusive for digital transformation towards achieving SDGs in remote and underserved communities. The third set, C includes gender equality in the development of new technologies. 13, guarantee that new technologies are developed within the regulatory framework that protect and promote women's rights and safety. 14, ensure and monitor that the government's social and economic digital inclusion plans include gender responsive budgeting and accountability in developing new technologies. 15, Support local internet entrepreneurs and private sector technology innovation targeted at rural communities. And the last one, 16, promote the development of new technologies created for women and by women that include a gender lens in their development and scale innovations that provide sustainable solutions to meet the needs of women and girls in all their diversity. Thank you so much um, for those enlightening recommendations regarding how to bridge the, di the gender digital divide and integrate a gendered lens into technological innovation. So with this, I would like to move to our second co-lead, Musopala Devi, who's the Regional Gender Advisor of the UNFPA Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. She will be presenting the recommendation for session two, fostering inclusive education in the digital age and promoting women and girls in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM, education, and careers. Mr. V, the floor is now yours, and I believe she's joining us online. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for the introductions and warm afternoon greetings to everybody. I'm actually right now in Istanbul, where we're having this uh, global UNFPA technical retreat. And it comes at a very unfortunate time because we are also grappling with multiple demands that has come to us because of the uh, very unfortunate earthquake that occurred on Monday early morning. So warm greetings again. As Sarah mentioned, I'll be uh, bringing forward to you the recommendations from session two that's on fostering inclusive education digital age and promoting women and girls in science technology engineering and mathematics education and careers so to begin the outset that uh session uh the session two 
is actually divided into two subsets. One subset is on addressing and redressing the digital divide through monitoring and improving digital literacy. And the second subset is on taking steps to involve more women and girls in science and technology fields. So if we come to the first subset, which is on addressing and redressing the digital divide to monitoring and improving digital, recommend, digital literacy, here are the recommendations. Firstly, establishing national and local frameworks for mapping and tracking targeted groups, digital skills and competencies. Establishing high quality and accessible digital learning platforms to empower teachers, learners, and families with different digital skills, including interventions that address the cultural and social perceptions of girls accessing digital platforms. We are also looking into incorporating digital skills into educational curricula as early as primary school to provide digital opportunities for all and to develop special initiatives to reach out to out of school children and marginalized communities. Promoting indigenous communities, context specific technology or digital solutions, taking into account the lived realities of such communities, for instance, their lack of appropriate infrastructure, inadequate schools, and teachers with limited or very low digital skills. Promoting initiatives between universities and local women's organizations to train women and girls in rural areas in basic digital skills customized for low skill and low literate users. Supporting programs for teachers and educators to use more digital tools in schools and other institutions, including ongoing training support with gender sensitive and safe content. And finally, scaling up partnerships with government, private sector, and other non-traditional partners to scale up accessibility and affordability of digital solutions for women and girls. So this is subset one of session two. I will now move on to subset two of session two, which is taking steps to involve more women and girls in the science and technology fields. And we, here we've come up with three recommendations. Number one is in supporting and enhancing women's STEM education through scholarships, internships, and training programs to con and considering gender quotas for admission into educational programs. The second is on encouraging girls to pursue STEM subjects in education by fostering women role models, female role models, I'm sorry, and mentors in STEM in schools, universities, and other educational institutions. And last but not the least, promoting school curricula that redresses gender bias and gender stereotypes relating to the STEM fields. And with that, I hand it back to the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. V, for these excellent recommendations on how to improve digital skills and literacy for women and girls and to increase female representation in STEM-related sectors. So now it's time to move to our third co-lead, Ms. Chane Lindstrom Okujang, who is the Social Affairs Officer from ESCAP, and she will present the recommendations for session three on implementing economic, labor, and social policies that ensure women are not left behind in the digital age and leveraging fi financing for inclusive digital development and gender transformative innovation. Chane, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Sarah, so much. We have comprehensive recommendations emanating from the very rich discussions of our session. Uh, we have also uh, divided this into three main segments. The first one you see already on the screen on boosting gender equality in the labor force through digital inclusion. The second section will be related to social protection policies and the third on digital development and innovation. Let's take a look at number 27 first. Address the gender dimensions of digital inequality and its effect on women's participation in the labor market at all levels, including in the gig economy. Invest in the promotion of equal access to critical digital infrastructure, professional trainings and educational programs to support women and promote women's participation to perform efficiently in the labor force. I'm just going to check here with my colleagues if this is the correct language that we have on this slide now. I recall that some language was changed on the gender balance towards the end of this. That perform efficiently had been removed. So we will move back to this and we will go to 28 to promote 
the development of national and we have lost our screen so you will just have to listen to me now promote the development of national and sub regional intergovernmental strategies as well as collaborative partnerships with the private sector that enhance women entrepreneurs managerial and innovative digital skills in the region support national efforts for digital and financial inclusion to increase women's entrepreneurship in, to increase women entrepreneurs access to digital financial services and empower women in micro, small, and medium enterprises, including small grants programs to digital entrepreneurs and or promoting crowdfunding platforms for financing startups. Empower women farmers through digital innovation and farming techniques to transition to sustainable smart agriculture. Support regulatory and legislative reforms and improvements in digital infrastructure that enable women to actively participate and run their businesses in the new digital entrepreneurship ecosystem. I'm going to speed up my dictation at this point because I only have seven minutes and I have another two slides exactly like this. Expand data collection and gender disaggregated data on digital inclusion, promote collaboration between women's ministries, women's organizations, and the private sector to share data collection responsibilities. Next slide, please. Extend social protection coverage to cover digital devices and necessities for vulnerable populations to ensure no woman is left behind. Invest in social protection programs such as digital safety net programs for vulnerable informal workers. Promote the collaboration between governments and mobile operators to implement mobile powered cash assistance as well as mobile money and e-wallets to accelerate financial digital inclusion of families and underserved persons and communities. Next slide, please. Foster the cooperation between women's ministries, female-led startups, and women's organizations to promote women's digital entrepreneurship through incubator programs. Motivate women to explore potential ideas, techniques, and business skills through these programs in urban and rural areas. Invest in female-led simulation labs and technical and high-impact initiatives that promote climate mitigation and adaptation to decrease women's vulnerabilities. Implement monitoring and evaluation strategies to support effective digital development and innovative policy making. And finally, encourage and promote boardroom representation to expose women in all their diversity to leadership roles to enhance their visibility, promote female role models, and redress gender stereotypes within the digital sphere. Thank you very much for your attention. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much indeed, Chanye, for sharing these thought-provoking recommendations regarding strengthening policy support to benefit women and foster gender-inclusive technological innovation. So now I'm delighted to invite our fourth co-lead, Ms. Melissa Alvarado, who's the Program Manager Ending Violence Against Women at UN Women Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Melissa will share recommendations from session four on addressing online and technology facilitated gender-based violence and discrimination and protecting the rights of women and girls online. Melissa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and I want to offer our thanks to all of the participants who have made contributions in session four. The recommendations are designed to reflect uh, many of the inputs that you have given and also to build on some of the recommendations from the other three sessions. So uh, there are quite a few, so I will also read a bit quickly. Uh, in the first section, uh, there, so there's two main sections. Uh, the first is address online and technology facilitated gender-based violence and its consequences. So uh, the first is recognize violence against women and girls in digital contexts as a human rights violation and form of gender-based violence against women and girls and adopt a comprehensive definition of online and technology facilitated violence against women and girls, which often manifests offline as well as online in line with international standards, conventions, or regulations. Next, have an intersectional approach to prevention and response to online and technology facilitated gender-based violence and recognize the needs of women and girls in all their diversity to leave no one behind. 
recognize that marginalized groups, public figures, or people with high visibility roles may be at greater risk for experiencing online and technology-related violence, such as journalists and media actors, women human rights defenders, and political figures. Collect and publish, publish data on the different forms of online and technology-facilitated gender-based violence, disaggregated by sex, ethnicity, income, age, disability, geographic location, and other characteristics relevant to national context. Systematically monitor, monitor and evaluate regulations, policies, and interventions to generate evidence on what works to prevent online and technology-facilitated gender-based violence and determine if they are having the attendant effects, thus strengthening accountability systems. Next slide, please. Continuing this section, recognize the importance of trauma-informed, survivor-centered approaches, take measures to include survivors in consultation processes and address their concerns during the development of policies, legislation, and rec regulations, provide funding for support services for survivors or victims that are gender-inclusive, survivor-centered, and trauma-responsive, Establish safe spaces, help desks, legal counseling, psychosocial support, and other support mechanisms, including online peer groups to support girls and women from marginalized groups who face online and technology-facilitated gender-based violence. These mechanisms should be able to offer safety planning for online and technology-facilitated gender-based violence. Create inclusive, survivor-centered, and rights-based complaint mechanisms that safeguard bodily autonomy anonymity, and confidentiality of women and girls. Encourage private sector actors to proactively address gender-based violence on their platforms, adopt gender transformative and safety by design approaches, which embed safety into the conceptualization, development, and implementation of digital technologies and related policies. Next slide, please. Following the same section uh, of addressing online and technology facilitated gender based violence and its consequences, invest in prevention measures such as gender transformative approaches, including through education settings to promote human rights and digital safety for all, and eliminate online and technology facilitated gender based violence. Ensure access to digital information on sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights as a way to enhance prevention of offline and online and technology facilitated gender-based violence. Foster regional collaboration between governments and national coordination among different government departments as well as between the private sector, civil society organizations, and other relevant stakeholders, including media, to prevent and respond to online and technology facilitated gender-based violence. Next slide, please. This is the, the beginning of the second section. This section is focused on ensuring effective implementation of legislation and policies to respond to and prevent online and technology facilitated gender-based violence. First, introduce effective gender transformative legislations, policies, and regulatory frameworks in line with existing international human rights instruments to address all forms of violence in digital context and provide survivor-centered justice not infringing on civil liberties of individuals. Next, review existing legislation to ensure that harmful social norms are not perpetuated and ensure that legislation and policies on gender-based violence include the issue of online and technology-facilitated gender-based violence and are adequately budgeted to allow their implementation. Develop policies and legislation to ensure that technology companies establish and enforce strict codes of conduct. Develop capacities of law enforcement and justice officials addressing online and technology facilitated gender-based violence and have clear codes of conduct to offer survivor-centered and trauma-informed responses. Increase the number of trained female officers to provide services to women survivors of gender-based violence, including technology facilitated gender-based violence. That might be the end. May I see if there's one more slide? I think that's our final. OK, those are the recommendations from session four. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Melissa, for the insightful recommendations on how to safeguard the rights of women and girls in the digital space and eliminate online gender-based violence. So with that, we come to the end of the presentations from the different sessions, and I will hand over to Chai Chai for the next part of the agenda. Thank you, Sarah. Now that we have heard a summary of recommendations, we will move on uh, into the plenary contributions uh, to the discussion on the recommendations. Um, let me emphasize again, this is not a formal intergovernmental meeting and the recommendation for the recommendations, we will not have a formal adoption process by member states. So the recommendations will be decided on uh, based on the general consensus of the meeting, yeah, of the meeting participants, just uh, to be clear on this, okay? So we will uh, now first invite government representatives followed by other stakeholders to share uh, your views uh, on the recommendations regarding achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls in the digital age. Uh, as in previous session, uh, to allow as many participants to have opportunities for interventions as possible, uh, we'd like to advise you to keep your intervention brief, uh, no more than two minutes. Uh, so let me take a look at uh, the request. Have we got any request from uh, government first? on the recommendations that have been presented uh, by our session leads and the moderators of the four substantive sessions. Uh, if you have any specific comment, perspectives on any of the recommendations uh, that was just uh, presented, uh, feel free to uh, put up your hand or your, the, the, card of the country. We will first give the uh, opportunity to the governments sitting in the room and online. Bangladesh. Okay, delegate from Bangladesh, please. Thank you very much uh, for summarizing the recommendations that has taken place with the last uh, sessions and congratulations to the presenters for the summary. Um, I understand that uh, we all we all know that uh, uh, much of the cyber uh, crimes taking place online and uh, digital platforms are due to the algorithm mechanism that has been adopted by different um, tech industries. So uh, the issue has been mentioned uh, by the two presenters in the past two days. Um, but I think it's the moral responsibility of the tech giants also to invest um, preventing cyber crimes because um, with the presence of uh, artificial intelligence, um, it's, a, it's a relatively easier for the te technological uh, giants to identify where the cyber crimes are taking place. So I think this forum can be used as a uh, platform to raise a uh, joint voice against, uh, the, to remind the technical giants about their responsibilities in preventing uh, much of the cyber crimes and uh, gender-based violence. Thank you very much. Thank you for your intervention, distinguished delegate of Bangladesh. Your comment is well noted. Next, I would like to invite a delegation of Timor Leste, please. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Just would like to say that thank you for the experts that um, uh, contribute to elaborate our recommendation for the uh, first uh, up to four session. I think for, for, for Timor-Leste, our recommendation is already included in all uh, your uh, elaboration uh, uh, and co comprehensive uh, recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your positive comments. Delegate from Tonga, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'd like to congratulate the Secretariat for a great um, list of recommendations. 
Um, I, I would like to, to um, the, the National Women's Machinery, the partnership um, in the collaborations with regard to these recommendations to, to have it cross-cutting the National Women's Machineries. We've also um, identified uh, government ministries such as education, the Ministry of Police and ministries in which IT is under. I, I would recommend that this be uh, cross-cutting across the, the recommendations as well as the uh, non-traditional partners such as the private sectors. Um, Yes, yes, um, I'm Madam Chair. I, I'd like to, to stop there. But recognizing the, the grassroots um, women's groups at the community level. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment and for emphasizing the uh, importance of the cross-cutting role of different government departments in collaboration, including collaboration with the private sector to address these issues. Your comment is well noted. Other comments, uh, whether in the room or online from the government, before we invite uh, the civil society comments as well? I don't see any for now, so let me give our civil society colleagues uh, the floor to share their perspectives and So for civil society, uh, we have uh, received a request from uh, SODEF, South Asia uh, Women's Development Forum, uh, Pakistan chapter. Ms. Um, uh, Maryam Khan, you have the floor, please. Thank you so much. Um, it is a great opportunity to speak at this forum and thank you very much for uh, all the recommendations and comments that we have. I just want to uh, share one perspective that is, as you know, that the poverty gap is increasing in the South Asian countries and uh, just giving them the opportunities for digital access and everything we really require to facilitate them in reaching the basic needs and sustenance as well. So uh, one of the fellow members talked about crowdfunding and also talked about, uh, you know, development of entrepreneurship. And I think every country has their chambers and associations who are working for the development for women. But unfortunately, when they need to give them digital equipment, it becomes difficult because it has become quite expensive. So uh, we have trained them. We have educated them. There are platforms where they could sell as well but unfortunately they do not have access to smartphones and things because they cannot afford it so in our part of the world uh, we other than the education gender equality we would require the processes to achieve the normal equipment that is required to be there thank you so much thank you very much for your thoughtful comments well noted any other intervention from uh, civil societies in the room? Okay, uh, the lady there, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Shifra Belongel from FOS Feminista, an international alliance for sexual and reproductive health and health rights and justice for women, girls, and gender diverse people in the global south. I am also speaking on behalf of civil society organizations that have come together in the regional CSO forum that preceded this regional consultation. So we welcome this year's priority theme as well as the recommendations raised in this session, recognizing the need to set policy norms on digitalization, technology, and innovation globally. In lieu of the international community coming together on these issues, we have left the setting of no rules and norms to the profit-seeking motives of big tech, the few global North-based companies that wield monopolistic power and decision-making over the use of the internet and our data. We must seek accountability and transparency from both government 
and the private sector over the consequences of the digital transformation, including job losses and lack of labor protections and the environmental costs of digitalization, a burden that will be carried by women and girls in the global south. In this light, the solution to the gender digital divide, among other issues and challenges, will not be solved by more digitalization but by looking at the systemic and structural barriers that prevent women and girls, particularly those ex experiencing multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination from participating safely and meaningfully in the ICT sector and digital spaces. We need to recognize that gender norms and stereotypes fuel technology facilitated gender-based violence and gender disinformation. These are particularly prevalent in our region and wielded against women journalists, women human rights defenders, and other women in the public eye. To address gender norms and stereotypes, we need comprehensive sexuality education, which touches an important piece of this year's theme, education. The increasing provision of CSE through digital tools and platforms has become an alternative response to unmet need for sexual and reproductive health and information for youth and adolescents, which means inclusion of CSE, and formal education curricula is still crucial. The Secretary General's report highlighted the positive health outcomes brought about by mobile applications facilitating sexual and reproductive health information and services. Sexual and reproductive health and rights relate to fundamental rights that enable women and girls to exercise autonomy and participate in public life. It is therefore important we open pathways to SRHR services, including legal and regulatory frameworks that protect and expand them, particularly self-care and digital health solutions, while ensuring protection of personal health data. We must center our human rights and the well-being of women and girls in all their diversity in the discussion of technology, innovation, and education. We need the technology to work for us and not the other way around. Thank you for your time and sorry for going over. Thank you very much for your thoughtful contributions. I will now hand over to Sarah to invite the next set of interventions. Thank you so much, Chai Chai. So to begin with, I would like to invite uh, the participant from ActionAid. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, moderator, and thank you. Uh, I uh, just want to make a couple of points. One is remind us all, I'm Farah Kabir, the country director of ActionAid Bangladesh, that we have to keep the investment on women, on girls at the top priority. We have to keep the investment to uh, address issues of gender-based violence. On uh, Given that situation or premise, then we have to look at the new developments which are because of innovation and technology and digitalization. We are suggesting that women be empowered to be a part of this technology and digitalization. And for that, we need the infrastructure, we need the investment. We are asking the governments to do this. The governments are already struggling, especially in the South, with the resources they have. Then my suggestion would be, or our suggestion would be, we should ask the tech giants to put in an investment here. We may put up a proposal that they create an endowment for safety and security of digital users because they are at the receiving end of the profit. And, and this is a reality today that we are in a digital world. So as we continue in a digital world, we would like to see investments forthcoming and only then the SDG goals or our digital equal, uh, equity, equality can be achieved. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insightful contribution. And I would like to open the floor now if there are any other um, participants from civil society who would like to take the floor. Please let us know. Okay. So um, I'll give it to the, the lady on the left, on my left first, and then we'll come to, to you afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. I thought I was on your right. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to reiterate and also support the recommendations read out by colleague coming from the CSO Forum. And one um, point um, specifically on the environmental footprints, which was highlighted in the statement of the CSO um, yesterday in the welcome, um, in the introduction session and also in my intervention, um, a particular recommendation to assess the current and potential environmental and climate footprints of digital technologies, including the impacts on women's rights and gender dimension. 
That's all. Thank you so much for your contribution. And now to the next delegate who indicated. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I would just like to um, include that um, meaningful access when, when we talk about it also includes the availability of information um, and resources online for women, especially for their needs when it comes to maternal uh, reproductive health. And if, if, this can, uh, if the language that can be used uh, in, in these resources could be in their own language other than English, because most of the content that we see online is, uh, uses uh, the English language. And also um, the recognition of um, women's right to code, to design um, um, applications and technology that are you know, women-centric, human rights-centric. Thank you. Thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, I'd like to open the floor again if there's anyone else who would like to come in. Okay, please, please take the floor. Hi, thank you so much, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to say heartfelt thanks for inviting the private sector to attend and participate. Um, if I might humbly, su humbly suggest, um, the truth is I think that um, many organizations in the private sector would really love to participate in some of these discussions. Um, and I think that uh, going beyond just the CSR team, um, but the more senior, the better, because that's where the true decision makers are. Um, and hence, getting them on board would really help shift the needle together um, so that we can all work in collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much for that suggestion. So I'd like to just open the floor again, if there is anyone else who would like to come in and noting that it's also the floor is also open, of course, for other government um, delegations who didn't have a chance to speak already and would like to come in. So the floor is open for all, all participants, just to emphasize from whichever sector. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I missed this on an, an online hand. So the government of Indonesia joining on, online would like to take the floor now. Uh, government of Indonesia, over to you. Thank you very much, moderator. Can you hear me clear? Can you hear we can, me? thank you. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, first of all, we appreciate that, this, that discussion in this regional consultation and uh, as reflection of our commitment on gender equality and women empowerment in, in principle, that we can support the recommendations on this note that we highlight that is pertinent for the recommendations are achieved through consensus manners. Uh, therefore, the recommendation must respect views and national context from all Asia-Pacific countries, so it reflects the spirit of consensus. Thank you. Thank you very much, and noted on your comment. I'd just like to open the floor uh, one more time, if there's anyone else who would wish to add anything. I'd like my colleagues to just confirm if they can see any hands online. I don't see anyone else indicating in the room that they wish to come in. Yeah. So dear participants, delegates, um, I believe that we have perhaps come to the end of, um, of our comments for this afternoon. I, so we now come to the end of the time allotted for interventions from stakeholders. I would like to thank all of the participants for sharing your contributions, both in the sessions and in this closing session. And I'd like to thank all of the UN entities for your fantastic support in bringing this session together. I'd also just like to mention that we will be sharing the draft meeting report and proposed recommendations with participants by next Friday, the 17th of February. So I will now um, hand over to our MC, Jessica, who will um, facilitate the closing session. Thank you, Ms. Nibs and Ms. Chai, Chai Chai for your moderation of this session. I now invite the Secretariat to take their seats in the audience. Before we begin our closing remarks, I would like to request all participants to please take a few moments to complete the electronic evaluation for this regional consultation. 
You will find the QR code on the screen momentarily, and we will also share the link in the chat box for our online participants. Please take a few moments to complete the evaluation now. Thank you everyone for working on the evaluation. Um, to end this reg regional consultation, we will now have our closing remarks from Ms. Chai Chai and Ms. Nips. Ms. Chai Chai, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jessica. Distinguished participants, as our regional consultation on the priority theme for the 67th session of the Commission on the Status of Women draws to a close, I'd like to thank all of the speakers and the participants for sharing your insights on achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls in the digital era. I'd also like to thank the session moderators for facilitating these constructive discussions and your valuable contributions. The Asia Pacific region faces a range of digital challenges, including the gender digital gap, a lack of female representation in STEM-related fields and cyber violence against women and girls, much remains to be done to ensure everyone benefits from the digital transformation. I'm truly encouraged by our conversations on the achievements and promising uh, practices governments and the civil society have shared towards achieving gender equality in relation to innovation, and technological change and education in the digital age. The proposed recommendations highlighted the urgent need to place women and girls at the center of the digital revolution, increase the female representation in STEM related areas and protect the rights of women and girls online. They recognize the importance of universal and meaningful connectivity and improving digital literacy for women and girls, especially those living in remote and rural areas. The recommendations also stress the need to build more inclusive education systems and labor markets to encourage more women and girls to pursue uh, STEM studies and careers. Furthermore, they acknowledge the damaging impacts of online violence against women and girls and reiterate the pressing need to eliminate cyber violence through collective efforts. Through our two days of fruitful discussions, 
We recognize the need to build a more secure, accessible, inclusive, and equitable digital world to harness the potential of digital transformation to benefit all women and girls. I believe representatives can take away from this meeting good practices and insights into how to integrate a gendered lens into the digital sphere, innovation and technological change. In the digital age, we must strive to fulfill our commitment of leave, leaving no one offline. In our response to these digital challenges and work towards the empowerment and equality of all women and girls in Asia and the Pacific. On behalf of ASCAP, thank you again to our partner, UN Women, with whom we jointly convened this regional consultation, as well as our co-organizers, including ITU, UNDP, UFPA, and UNICEF, for your contributions to making this successful, a successful consultation. I'd also like to express our appreciations to all UN colleagues for their hard work in putting together this important consultation. Once again, thank you to all the participants, representatives from government, from civil societies, for your very important contributions to this dialogue. With that, I will uh, hand over to Ms. Sarah Nips for her final remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chai Chai. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, and dear participants, we have now come to the end of what has been a very enriching consultation on the CSW 67 priority theme. We've received inputs from our distinguished delegates and participants, both in the room and online, and have discussed a number of issues which will be important in enriching the recommendations that have been compiled. What is clear is that while technological advancements are much needed, and are being made in the digital space at a fast rate, we are failing to bring on board a significant proportion of the region's population, particularly women and girls, most notably those from low income households, including among the urban poor, rural women, and indigenous and hard to reach communities, among others. If we are to advance towards realizing a sustainable future for all, we need to ensure that we are working towards access for all to digital skills, and relevant, accessible, and affordable technologies in order to facilitate women and girls to be active agents in all spheres of development and society. Furthermore, more needs to be done to strengthen measures and accountabilities in relation to human rights abuses and other violations that are perpetuated either with the use of ICTs or in the digital space. Additionally, we need to take urgent action in both the education sector and the workplace to deal with regressive social norms and practices that perpetuate inequalities. Finally, we need to consider how we are factoring in the impacts of human activities linked to technological advances on the environmental health of our planet and the communities that are, are directly impacted by such efforts. This issue must not be understated as we consider the state of the environment today. Distinguished delegates, we hope that you will consider the recommendations that have been discussed here as you review the zero draft agreed conclusions for the CSW 67, which have already been shared for member state inputs ahead of the global session in New York next month. We encourage member states to engage with your civil society and other non-government partners in this regard to support us all in realizing comprehensive conclusions that can support the vision for an inclusive and sustainable future for all. Finally, on behalf of UN Women, I want to once again appreciate all of your active participation over the past two days, and to conclude by wishing you safe travels back to your countries. And of course, I wish to echo the thanks of Chai Chai, the appreciation of ESCAP as our partner in convening this, as well as our appreciation of all of the other UN agencies that have been active in bringing this session together, including ITU, UNFPA, UNICEF, and UNDP. Thank you so much, everyone, and over to you, Jessica. Yes, let's give everyone a round of hand. Thank you, Ms. Nips and Ms. Chai Chai. Excellencies, distinguished guests and participants, 
We hope you have found the discussions as insightful and as constructive as we have. We will share the draft meeting report by the end of next week with participants. Please have a good rest of your day and good evening.